you're going to take in terms of. I'll let you dispose of Okay. Um, nice to see you all. Yeah, thank you Thanks for joining me. Um, H93 is um, on our um, committee website. It's under Maria's name. If people want to pull that up, okay. that's Representative Madison. Sure. Um, I'll start by giving a brief overview, Representative Maslin, Deffert, um, H93, brief, brief overview of, of um, Make Ready, because I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with it. We've had a little bit of it. A little bit, but not a whole lot. Well, let me just say Make Ready is both a, an activity and a process. It's an activity in that somebody has to go out to a utility pole and make room for a, a new cable of some course, you know, in, in, in my case it's a fiber optic, um, my case meaning easy fiber, the one that we've been working with here for a while. Um, <clears throat> it's also a process because in order to get the make ready completed, an applicant, easy fiber or what's it, Mansfield Community Fiber, you know, fi files an application, oh, um, pays money on a per poll basis. Um, and that money can, um, covers the, 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 the activity of um, people going out, surveying the polls one at a time, making notes as to what has to be done, agreeing on what has to be done, and then the poll owner generally or, or other people on there have to move their cables around in order to make room for um, the new cable. And um, EC Fiber being the poster child here um, had incredible frustration, incredible frustration um, over a couple of years as we were beginning to build out whereby the, the process that is in the department's rules wasn't being followed at all. Um, basically from the time an application is filed and, pay, and fee is paid, there um, is 120 days during which time the various sort of steps are to be completed. And with the, with the um, particularly with uh, everybody's favorite nemesis, at least in our area, um, Comcast, um, after 120 days, they would begin thinking about going out and getting the work done. Um, and, and we had months of delays. And we'd already paid in advance to have this money, I mean, work being done. Um, furthermore, sometimes a number of cables need to be moved. You know, Congress needs to move, or Verizon may need to move something. Um, uh, you know, now it's consolidated. Fair point, that's the ne nemesis I was thinking of. Um, <laughs> needs to move something, and if, and if they didn't have, and if they didn't have um, people available, um, they'd hire a subcontractor. And so in some cases, in our area, it would be Eustis Cable. Eustis would ca Cable would go out for Fair Point and move something, and then they go back to the shop and then a few days later or a week later or a month later or something, um, Comcast would ask, ask them the same, same use as cable to go out to move something and on and on when in case, um, so, so it gets us to one touch make ready which is the heart of the bill which is, which is to have the department adopt by rule the requirement that a lot of this stuff with the exception of the top of the pole which is the electric stuff, which is dangerous to work on. Everything below the um, electric transmission could be done by one contractor, approved contractor. Go out and move consolidated or fair point or um, everybody all the yeah. way down through. Um, and, uh, and the new cable could go up and we'd all go merrily on our way and everybody would have better fit the service sooner. Um, so that's the general gist of the bill. And not also, grateful that for Clay's participation because as many of you know the department has introduced a motion um, to do much the same thing in the bill. Um, very similar all the way down through and it is good that both efforts are moving along simultaneously because we wouldn't want anyone to lose interest. You know? So, I, so the one thing that is in my bill that's not in the department's um, motion has to do with joint ownership of polls Sometimes they're owned by GMP, sometimes by Consolidated, sometimes by someone else. But occasionally there's a um, there's a joint ownership of poll, rare, but um, but out there. And our experience has been that um, 
party A would go to its work on the poll and then say, oh, geez, maybe we should get another, party B wants another 120 days to do their work. And, and, um, and there's really no reason at all why everybody couldn't just get together and shake hands and get the work done, particularly if it's one touch, regardless of whether there's one owner or two or more. So, um, and as you all understand in this committee, this is in the interest of providing Vermonters, particularly in the back of the country, either unserved or, or very much underserved with high quality, high speed internet and phone line, um, which is what EC Fiber does and the other startup um, CUDs or whatever, um, communications utility districts are, are set about to do. And so, Laura? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, anyway, um, you'll notice in the bill reference to, to Maine. There's one section that references Maine. Um, Maine has adopted One Touch Make Ready and has a rule that we would like the department to follow. Um, I'm sure Irv Tomei, who some of you are familiar with, and he's going to be with us this afternoon, um, has, has, some, <coughs> has some tweaks that we've worked out. Um, but the the gist of it is one touch, touch make ready will, will save all everybody a whole lot of trouble and, and advance service much faster. And so whether or not the department follows Maine's rule or not, that's what we had a year ago without having the department's motion, um, is perhaps, it's a good <coughs> model to start with. It has very good provisions in it. Most of it is good. Um, and. Um, and we'd like you to go forward with that. The, the other thing that I pointed out that's in our rule is, in our proposed legislation, is what's essentially a bill back provision, which is if the 120 days has elapsed and the work hasn't been done and a CUD has already paid to have the work be done, um, they could hire a qualified contractor. It might be used as cable again or someone else to go and do the work and um, and build back that work against the um, make ready payment that had already been paid. I mean, you know, fair is fair here. Um, and right, I <laughs> why why pay like extra for more aggravation? Let's I'm just, with you. Let's, I am one of them. There with okay. you. So let's. I mean, that's basically the gist of the bill, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So Scott, now. Um, I was just going to ask about about uh, spacing requirements and whether um, poles are getting crowded. Um, I don't know if any of you drive through Hanover between Dartmouth College, for example, and DHMC, and you'll see poles that are that are just covered with all kinds of cables. Mm -hmm. um, I have, um, but you, I have that question. I mean, the short answer is yeah, I suppose so. Um, the, the longer answer was ask, ask the department because they're much more familiar with that than, than I am. But I can also say that um, the department has rules. Um, um, when an entity like Mansfield Cable or something, you know, um, um, back up a little bit. The, um, our statutes require that we provide, we be, they or whoever be provided space, um, and we pay rental. Um, there's an issue that we could, that's not in the bill, that um, in some cases an outlier like Easy Fiber is paying a dollar, is paying for two foot of space, um, and our favorite fair point may be only paying a dollar a foot, you know, or somebody. And um, the department is working through that process, um, which will be better for the upstarts. Um, and we'll see where they work through that. Okay. But um, but yeah, some are crowded, but so far it hasn't been a prohibition about about getting work done. Robert? Uh, this is sort of related, and the department may or may not have the answer, but I just wonder whether in, in your own experience or knowledge about EC Fiber, the incidents that that a make ready actually requires the changing of a pole for a, um, a taller pole. It, it frequently happens. Okay. Um, there's two two kinds of, of versions of that. Um, in some cases, we do need a taller pole. Um, in which case, we pay for the pole yeah. about a thousand bucks. 
Um, there are other times when during the write out, which is the process where the the applicant and the utility pole owner and other people go out and look at each pole one at a time. They'll say, yeah, this pole um, needs to be a teller pole, but this is an old decrepit pole. Um, it's not on EC Fiber or Mansfield. It's on it's on the utility. It's on the owner because the the pole is the pole is out of spec anyway. Um, but in any case, they have to be changed, and that's time consuming, and and we'd like the work done. Ron, no more. Um, so my initial question was about pole yeah. rental and fees, but you've addressed that. Yeah. Or not. Well, um, <laughs> it's being it's being addressed. Right. Um, so I'll ask myself, does one touch require any, um, is it purely a bureaucratic streamlining or does it require additional training for crews or um, uh, um, licensing? Our experience is it's primarily bureaucratic because the people that go out to do the work are qualified, otherwise they wouldn't be there. There is a step where um, um, Mike's cable company, for example, would, would apply to the department and be certified or licensed or something to go to one touch make ready, um, as, as established that they are <laughs> qualified to do the work. Um, they have proper procedures for signage and you know all that sort of stuff. But but that's but that's a step that should be done really quite quickly. It's not a it's not a hassle. It, um, it's done anyway. Right. It's just certifying new people to do it to work up and down the pole with the exception of power transmission. So I have a couple of questions, Jim, just to clarify. Sure. Um, so you had mentioned that Comcast was a big problem in your neck of the woods. Was that correct or did you mean consolidated or did you mean both? Um, um, <laughs> my, my, the, the, the primary um, difficult entity was Fairpoint. Okay. Um, they seem to be, seem to us, as I said, um, the 120 days would lapse and then they'd begin to think about what they needed to do. So it's primarily consolidated? Um, pro yeah. Um, things seem to be a little better. That was going to be my next question. It was going to be things, about things what you're seeing for trends. Things seem to be a little better, but it's the middle of winter, so, so we're not building much right now. Ask me again in June. So when, so can you, in terms of seeming to get better time, yeah, you know, like was in the last month or so, the last um, I, six I, I couldn't, I answer you differently. I couldn't, um, um, we had terrible problems last, last summer and last fall, up until. The summer of uh, Summer 18 of 18. And fall of 18. 17 and 18, we yeah. had terrible problems. Mm -hmm. The more we wanted to do, the more we had problems. Uh -huh. And as I said, an entity, this is work for someone, this is employment mm -hmm. for Eustace Cable or Mike's Cable or, you know, da da da. Um, the application fee has been paid. Someone should just go and do it. And what was the explanation from Consolidated? Um, and on and on. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, was there anything, I mean? Oh, um, Maybe Irv can, you could ask Irv the same okay, question um, because he has I been, I mean, I can give you a list of reasons, but they are all, Sorry. in my opinion, um, um, not substantial enough to, um, but sometimes, for example, Laura, I can give you something. GMP needs to replace a pole. Mm -hmm. um, and before the pole can go up, nothing can be moved because there's no pole to put it on. Um, and as it turns out, when, um, Mansfield Cable, EC Fiber wants to build a road. Um, we require any sensible business person to understand all the make ready needs to be done on the entire road before we can send a crew out to put our cable up. So if there's foot dragging on one or two poles, then that road um, is um, out of commission until we until it gets done. And if, you, if we, we are approached, EC Fiber's approach is to try to build a whole town. We, we built five towns last year. Um, so um, if pole licenses for a whole road are um, lacking, we just can't work. You know, we have to build a road here, build a road there. We're waiting for six licenses. We're waiting for 12 licenses, meaning the whole road. Um, I don't know if I've quite answered your question, but um, the work needs to get done, and it's employment for somebody. 
and its service for Watson Bridge and Monitor. Well, my question was around, and I will ask her, but my question was around, you know, are you getting an explanation, any explanation um, consistently as to why it's taking so long from the company? The one that I can offer you now, I just, yeah. you know, poles need to be replaced, and until that's done, none of the work can be done. And if party A takes 120 days or 150 days or, you know, longer, um, GMP owns some poles and the utilities own some poles, um, then that, that's an excuse. And then they, well, geez, you know, finally there's a new poll. I get 120 days more, don't I? Um, it's just ridiculous, in my opinion, which is contrite for today, or, you know, concise for today. Mark? So, so my question is, so this make ready work that's not completed, yeah. and you hire another outfit that's qualified, yeah. is there issues around the price that that other outfit might charge, and how they handle the cable or um, pools, or? No. No? That is because when an, an applicant pays for a, a pole license, um, the pole license covers all the work that's going to be done. So if I hire Scott, and he's qualified, there's a the money's money's been paid. The department holds it, I think, or I'm not sure. You could ask. Um, you could ask. Um, no, I think actually the poll owners and the and the, and the utilities they have the money already. So if Scott can't charge double and, no. and build back any cost. No. There's a set cost. Well, there's a top cost. We okay. paid for it. Okay. We paid for it. Somebody's okay. paid for it. And anybody in the room when can correct me, but but. Um, my understanding is when we pay for a poll license, your company pays for a poll license, that's for everything that needs to be done there. So when it says any cost, sir, there is a, a maximum? Right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you guys may want to take testimony and, and qualify any costs, but my understanding is poll license has been applied for, um, paid for, um, and as far as the new um, Fiber optic cable company has paid. Uh, is, is concerned that the money's been paid and it covers whatever is supposed to be done. Um, Did you have a question? Yes. Um, well, a simple question: Are there only it, does uh, whatever certification is required cover all of the utilities on the pole except for the electric wires? Yeah. So there's only two certifications: one for electric wires and one for everything sure. else. Sure. Um, the um, the, the electric transmission is completely beyond what we're asking for. Right, right. No, so, no, just, just, just to be clear, any company that is certified to work on telephone cables, sure. or fiber cables, or whatever, yeah, can yeah. work on all, all of them except for the electric yeah, wires. Everything, everything below the yeah. electric transmission, um, and I also should point out, if it's a new pole, um, regardless of whether it's one that's out of spec or one that an applicant is paying for, um, the utility electric utility has to do its work first. Right. It's the top of the pole. They have to do their work first. Makes sense. Um, and then the underlings follow along. Right. Well, well, and then following up on Mark's question, it sounds like there is a set rate, um, whatever the word is, tariff or something, for, for yeah, the pole. That's license, correct. The, the, license. the license fee for the pole right. it applies to whoever does the work. So that's what um, they go for. There are tariffs. Um, Thanks for using that term. Um, that's correct. And um, we had a, a question on GMP raising its tariffs when they took over from from CCV, but that's nothing that I'm addressing, and it is what it is. Okay. Last question. I've got a little bit of nuance to the EC fiber in particular. If so you want to talk about it now or <laughs> later, I just wanted to okay. mention that I've got a little more info. If well, we're actually talking about this, but I want to be uh, cognizant of Representative sure. Maslin's time. Hey, my time's your time. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> well in that case, no, sure. your, time, your, time is, is right. at, your time is at a premium and right. you've got a room full of people. Who Thank want. you for uh, for joining us, Jim. Thanks for having me out. Yep. Hearing yep. out. Right. Appreciate it. Oh, one other. No, um, when you get to the subject of increased resources for, for um, telecommunications build out, I do have a sentence or two to add, um, but your time is limited, so I'll come back when you want me. Okay. Is that, that means the money somewhere? Is that what you're telling us? 
Well, yeah, we um, money is uh, at its premium in this state, but um, there are good ways to put it to use for telecommunications build out, and, and I have an idea or two. And there's uh, there's a bunch of bills. Um, Laura's got a bill, and and um, maybe the time to testify is when your bill's up or something like that. Thank you. Clay, can you join us again? And, and or um, you said you yes. brought someone out. Yes, okay. this is Sarah okay. Sevens. She's okay. an attorney uh, that is uh, working on the rulemaking. So, um, and to, to kind of put a finer point on Representative Madison's testimony, I, I just, just for the committee's benefit and for mine in particular, um, wanted to just get a little more information on um, the uh, the. the um, the case or the docket that you've opened with the PUC on this particular <coughs> issue. Sure. Um, to the extent you can share information. Absolutely. I think I can share everything okay. with you. Um, so, uh, you know, right now, it's, rulemaking is not a contested case, so there's um, and certainly it's just a petition, so there's nothing con uh, confidential yep. right now. Um, uh, it's something that we have been thinking about for a very long time, and we've certainly heard the complaints of attaching entities um, uh, that the whole attachment rules as written uh, created a very lengthy and um, a very lengthy process which frankly pole owning utilities didn't always follow 100% um, and usually where applications fell down was in the time periods were they adhering to the time periods outlined in the rule? Um, uh, were they getting the work done within 120 days? And you also have this issue with um, most poles in, in Vermont have um, multiple attachers. So the electric utilities at the top, and then you have one or more telecom providers at the bottom. And the way make ready work happens under the, our rules currently is that um, if you want to attach to poles, you submit a pole license application to the pole owning utilities. So in the case, if, it, if Consolidated owns the poles, you would submit it to them. Uh, if GMP owns the poles, you would submit it to GMP. And if they're dual poles, you would sit, submit applications to both. Um, then once uh, application uh, is submitted, um, there, I believe the next step is that the pole owning utility, um, there's an application fee. Uh, they, I think they do a preliminary look at those poles and say, okay, this is, uh, we're going to go out and do a make ready survey. This is the cost of the make ready survey. You pay that. The survey happens. The survey entails um, the, uh, an agent or an engineer of the attaching entity and uh, an engineer from the pole owning utility and they go out together and they look at the poles and then the pole owning utility comes up with an estimated make ready cost which is then paid by the attaching entity once the payment is made um, then that starts the make ready process uh, the electric company goes first um, then and this is the case in, mo in most instances um, the electric company doesn't really have to do anything. It's it's the telecom providers that need to move down. So, uh, Fairpoint consolidated the phone company. The incumbent phone company is almost always on the bottom, so they move down first, and then next goes uh, your cable television provider. They're usually second in line. They move down next, and then any other CLEX facility-based CLEX that are on the pole. Your fiber providers, level three, first light, those kind of providers, they move down um, after. And then you, uh, the, broad, the, the attaching entity may go up and attach. Um, they're clear to do the work, and they can uh, uh, commit to construction. This may be a simplistic question, yeah. <laughs> but it strikes me. <laughs> if the, uh, the phone company goes up at a predetermined position, and other entities go above that. Why doesn't the phone company go there and the other entities start at the top and work down so they don't all have to move? There's just there's already a space there. That's an engineering question. Uh, 
that I don't know that I have the answer to. I, I think it has something to do with you know the size of the cables and the fact that the telephone companies are frequently you know, doing work up there much more with a, a much higher frequency than um, than a company like First Light or Level Three. Um, but it's just industry practice that you know, the telephone company is going to be on the bottom, followed by the cable company. Um, Seems like there ought to be a way to avoid everybody needing to move so the next guy goes in. Right. And by guy being a gender neutral term in this case. Okay. I was just going to say, I think it has to do with the missions as well. Um, if the attaching entity is higher, then they can actually have a, a bigger spread as far as um, service goes. I think that has to do with it, too. Um, and to Clay's point, uh, the, the telephone companies, the cable companies, they desire to be the lowest, on the, at the lowest point on the pole. Uh, the reason for that, I, I couldn't tell you. It's because why? I, I'm not sure why that is, uh, but it may very well have to do with the frequency that they have to go and do work. So they want to be at the lowest point on the board. So, so you want as much spread between voltage and other conductive materials as possible. Um, so if you've got a power line next to a phone line, it induces a current which can cause static and lousy connection. So if they want as much spread as possible. They also want to be as high off the ground as possible so they don't get hit by trucks. Yes, so there is there there is a sweet spot for telecom. <laughs> and there's there's a safety zone between the neutral and where the, the highest telecom attaching entity can be. That's 40 inches. So um, there's a limited space in which, you know, and where a telecom provider can, can be. So frequently that when you have many providers on the same pole, that requires a higher pole um, if an additional attacher is going to become uh, attached. But um, I appreciate that explanation. Um, uh, it's certainly the industry standard nationwide. I've looked at telephone poles in other states, and it's, it's no different. The phone company's always on the bottom, followed by the cable company, followed by um, fiber. And of course, fiber is not doesn't have the same exposure to uh, to static because it's light passing through glass. So um, uh, uh, that's certainly the reason for that. But um, there are inefficiencies in the make ready process, which we're hoping that our petition um, uh, seeks to or act, will help address. So we've we've offered a petition that. Um, uh, provides a, a one-touch make-ready solution for um, attaching entities. So they can, um, we can have just one contractor go out and move all attachments. And I think Representative Maslin's example of Eustace Cable, they are certainly one of the, the most uh, popular uh, cable construction contractors in the state. They are our contractor, so we are a attaching entity, the Department of Public Service for our fiber. We use Eustace. DC Fiber uses Eustace. I believe Comcast uses Eustace. I mean, everyone's using Eustace. So there are these situations where Eustace is going out one day, moving the cable, going out the next day, oh moving God, the cable, <laughs> moving, going out, and, and they could just move them all at once, right? So, and, and it's, it's in part because there's this make-ready process where the pole owning utility, um, commissions attacher number one to go out and move um, its stuff, then commissions attach, uh, attacher number two. And there's there's actually an online um, system that most uh, utilities in the state use called NJUNS. Um, and I mentioned this yesterday, so I should have uh, looked it up. The, but it's a, it's a system by which the pole owning utilities can issue tickets to all of its attachers saying, all right, it's your turn to move, now it's your turn to move, now it's your turn to move. So um, a one-touch make-ready does simplify the process because only one contractor is going out and moving everything. And I would say that this is not, uh, we're not going to be a test case for this. Um, 
most, or not should say most states, but uh, about 22 states now are using one touch make ready. Um, at least 22. There, there are two types of um, pole attachment rules in the country. There's states that have given up jurisdiction over poles to the FCC. So we call those reverse preemption states. They've said, okay, FCC, you can be the the regulator of polls for our state. And then there are states that have retained jurisdiction, like Vermont. Um, so we uh, we have not adopted the FCC's rules. And if there's a dispute over poll attachments, that's handled at the uh, Public Utility Commission, not at the FCC. So we're one of those states that's not within the FCC's um, poll attachment regime. The FCC has adopted one touch make ready. So if the state is in an FCC reverse preemption state, they are using one touch make ready. Maine, uh, which is also mentioned in the legislation, is not an FCC state, and they have a similar rule that allows, it's not one touch make ready, but if a carrier is not, if a pole owning utility is not performing where it should, um, it, there are rules that allow for the pole attaching entity to hire a contractor pre-approved by the pole owning utility to go out and do their work for them. Um, and so that's another option under our proposal. I want to let you finish, and, okay. uh, but there's a couple of questions if you're okay. Kind of sure, I'm okay. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, um, so uh, I thought I heard Representative Maslin say that um, the motion or the uh, petition by the department, the Public Utility Commission, does not include the Build Back Authority. Uh, is that correct, or and, and does that require legislation in order to do that, or uh, is that something that could be included in your petition? The um, make ready rules require the pole attaching entity to pay the actual costs of uh, make ready work. So there are two types of costs in, in this um, in this world. One is the make ready work, and then the pole attachment fees. The pole attachment fees are set by statute. Uh, excuse me, not by statute, but by tariff. So it's a it's a tariffed rate. If they want to increase or decrease that rate, um, they have to seek permission from the Public Utility Commission, and those are set um, uh, at uh, costs of maintenance. Um, the make ready costs are the just the actual cost of um, the pole owning utility to do the make ready survey and do the make ready work. So if the pole needs to be replaced, for instance, the pole attaching entity pays for that. I might not be getting at your question. And I yeah, um, I don't think there are. But, um, so in the uh, example that Representative Maslin gave, the particular entity that's supposed to do the work uh, is delaying, 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 and so the, uh, the fees have already been paid uh, according to whatever they determined would be the charges for, the, for that, the cost of that. And um, so the requester gets frustrated and says, okay, I'm going to hire my own contractor. Contractor comes out, does the work, um, and instead of billing the person that hired them or the entity that hired them, uh, they go after the prepaid fees. Does, is that is that something that's re, that, that the, requires under, statute? Under our proposed rules, the, the new attacher would pay for everything. But they're not paying twice. That's right. Yeah. yeah. You know, so then what? They get a refund from the original? Uh, um, I believe the contractor gets paid by the the pole and utility, correct? We didn't really provide for that in our proposed rule. Um, so the way we have it right now is that uh, under the, we have, we have it so it's a dual scheme where uh, you can go through the standard make ready process. Mm -hmm. If uh, there 
the timelines are exacerbated, then uh, you can practice self-help, at which time you hire your own contractor to come in. And uh, we didn't specifically uh, provide for how fees would be paid in that scenario, uh, but I would surmise that uh, the new attacher would pay for their contractor in that scenario. Under the uh, One Touch Make Ready option, the new attacher would pay for the survey, for the actual um, make ready process, and uh, that's really where it ends. And if it were prepaid, though, if it were prepaid, they, you wouldn't want them to pay twice, right? Right, yeah, so that, that may be something that we need to, to bring up in the rulemaking <coughs> proceeding. And it's not, can you do that by rulemaking, or does it require legislation? That's what I'm trying to get at. No, that can certainly be handled um, by, by rulemaking. I think the rulemaking authority of the board in this case is um, fairly broad, so. Um, Luckily, so is the yeah. ability of the legislature. <laughs> so the, right. Well, the question was, what, what would it require a, uh, so I'm certainly not trying to insult your, <laughs> um, your authority in any way, um, but the, um, the discretion of the PUC at this point um, would be that they would they would have the ability to take care of that. So certainly we don't want to see a windfall to a coal owning utility who can just take your money, not do anything, and then have you commit to hiring a contractor and paying twice. And certainly that's not something that uh, our rules were contemplating in any way. So Mark and then Robbie. This is going a little bit further with what Mike's talking about. My concern would be, is there an opportunity for an independent contractor not to get paid? Or is that money always there and, and they can draw from it? Or So if they were installing for another provider, is there an opportunity for them to have to wait a long time to get paid for what the work they did? Um, I don't believe our rules have addressed that issue to such a finite level, but I, I do believe it's a concern. Um, I, my experience with uh, cable construction companies that we've dealt with is that they do not tolerate going unpaid. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, they, they will, uh, they will certainly um, not do the work for free or have an expectation of going unpaid. So to the extent that there's a gap in our proposal, and it is just a proposal, so um, there is a process that the board will go through before it even proposes a final rule that would then go through the rulemaking process. And I anticipate that there will be 25 or 30 entities um, all um, ripping our rule apart and proposing changes. So. Um, uh, if uh, if that's not clearly spelled out, um, I anticipate that the final rule would certainly uh, require that any monies paid to a uh, pole owning utility would go to cover the cost of that contractor. Um, yeah. Certainly, the way it is in Maine. So. Right. Um, does your proposal, as far as you know, address the question of, of uh, spacing one foot? Some entities are required to. Let's say uh, two foot. That's a separate proceeding. Separate. So yeah. that there is an active rulemaking underway now to address that question. Okay. So let's go. Okay. Um, you said uh, make ready is a an actual cost. Is that a direct bill through, or was that a negotiated estimate actual cost that was set, and that's the charge for each make ready? The make ready. Uh, there are so yes, there are. I think what you're getting at is there are contracts for. Um, so entities often enter into full license agreements that cover, um, that, that can cover charges uh, about what it's going to cost for make ready. Does that answer your question? It, if, if it costs $10,000 to make one pole ready, does that entire cost get directly billed to the party that is causing that make ready work to be required? I do believe it is. Okay. Um, is that in statute or in PUC? 
rules. So that would be NPC rules. I, I think what you're asking is: there, is there a standard charge for? There's a standard charge for the a, a tariff for uh, attaching the wires. Right. right. Just like monthly license. It's just monthly license. Oh, it's a monthly license. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's not a there's not a, 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 a standard um, fee or cost or whatever for actually physically putting the wires on the pole. That's that's a that's an estimated cost or a cost basis. There's a one-time mm -hmm. make ready and then a monthly attachment fee. Right, right. Yes. Okay. But yeah. I mean the cost the cost of actually doing the work is uh, customized to the to the job. To the yes. Yes. Okay. And and that's um, determined, you know, when, when the survey's done. So my only other question was does does the department have a position on uh, representative Maslin's bill? Um we uh we certainly can't oppose it because uh, we're proposing to do the same thing. I think we support it. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> don't you don't have a bill back, it. right? What's, do you have a bill back in your proposal? Uh, a bill back for, oh, uh, no, I think that's what Representative Maslin determined yeah. was the one fundamental yeah. difference. Right, right. But at heart, we're, we're trying to solve the same problem, and so, um, so I, guess, I, so I guess the question is, does the department support the bill that provision in, the, in, the, in, in Representative Madison's bill as an alternative to, to uh, the rule that is being considered? I will um, postpone judgment on that until I check, but I think okay. so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Clay, we started um, questioning you maybe before you were finished talking about it. So, uh, if, you, if there's more you want, want to add about the the, um, the case you've opened for the uh, no, the, I think it. I think the what we've discussed so far um, covers it. I would say there is one difference between our uh, our proposal and the bill, and and that's that we we didn't make a distinction between. I guess a simple make ready or telecom make ready versus electric. Mm -hmm. um, under our one touch make ready, if the if the contractor is qualified to work in the electric space, then that um, that can certainly be part of the, uh, the make ready solution. Is there a um, uh, is there a time frame by which you're anticipating? Um, Smoke coming out of the PUC chimney. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's February 25th. So, under the uh, Vermont Administrative Procedures Act, yeah. the commission has until they have 30 days um, during which they can either initiate a rulemaking proceeding or deny to do so. Uh, and they have to explain why they deny. So, they have until February 25th to do so. And that will then um, start the, the rulemaking process, which we anticipate will involve a lot of stakeholder involvement. We have requested in our petition um, for the PUC to hold a workshop, at least one, possibly two to three workshops, where stakeholders can come to discuss uh, the proposed rules. We can explain them, uh, and we can get everybody's input to try and come to some sort of consensus. And uh, just from judging from uh, Prior rulemakings, ones that are still going on, there is um, a rulemaking proceeding uh, for the uh, pole attachment rates that's currently underway. That you may that's know separate. about. That is separate. Uh, it's all under uh, Rule 3.700, but they are separate sections. Um, that, just to give you an idea, uh, that one has been going on for um, two years now. To at least two years. Oh, yes. uh, so, so these things can can be lengthy. Okay. So, um, I'll ask this question on my behalf, but we also have new members of the committee in addition to myself. Um, in terms of the rulemaking process and what that entails, um, the legislature will often um, enact uh, a law, a statute, and um, the next step in the process is um, rulemaking relative to that statute. And that process um, sometimes winding its way back through the legislature, through the um, th through LCAR. Um, the rules that you're talking about, um, PUC um, coming up with, are um, 
I'm unclear on the process. Well, I'll state something. You tell me if this is incorrect. You have put forward a recommendation as to how things would work with PUC essentially hanging the meat on the bone, the, 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 uh, the rules, if you will, related to that recommendation. Is that a fair um, analogy? Yes. So we, as part of our petition, we've proposed an actual rule. Yep. Certainly they could adopt that rule as it's written, but likely they will hear from parties, they will make changes, they will propose an alternative rule okay. that may be very similar, may be very different. And the timing of the finality of that is, is uh, again, presuming at the end of the month that they say, yes, this is something we're going to take a deeper look at and move forward on, the timing of when those final rules would come out would be unclear. Yeah. Yes. Fast would be six to eight months. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be very fast. Mm -hmm. okay. I did want to correct um, my testimony. Well, um, there is a section in our proposal that states poll and utilities shall refund amounts collected from attaching entities for work subsequently completed by outside contractors. Okay. So. Okay. That's all. Okay. So I have a question going back to the connectivity kind of fund. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to get back to that, or uh, I wasn't. I was intending to take a bio break. Um, oh, okay. For the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> for the chairs benefit. I mean, for the chairs benefit. Uh, we have a ranking member here, but. <laughs> and, and so, um, you're welcome to ask that question. I'm going to excuse myself, okay. and we're going to. Um, what I want to let you know, um, sir. Do you know when Laura's going to be back? Uh, I do. Okay. Um, what I'm. Um, um, what, what I'd like to do is have the committee, um, following your question, reconvene at 11.30, from 11.30 to noon, and we're going to have a committee discussion on a broadband bill. Um, so... Okay. So the question I have is, uh, the governor, governor's uh, budget proposal included $955,000 of uh, surplus revenue to direct the connectivity fund. Um, Assuming, assuming that the Appropriations Committee um, decides to use that surplus revenue for that, uh, and or uh, assuming that they don't decide to use re surplus revenue for that, um, does the department have any uh, recommendations as to otherwise provide money for the USF or for the connectivity fund? I think I just telegraphed my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that is the uh, proposal for um, funding the connectivity initiative this year. This is the one time uh, $955,000. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify a question the uh, uh, connectivity fund is uh, capital expenses only? Or is it? For the uh, connectivity yeah. initiative, connectivity yes. Initiative. So we're, um, to put it plainly, we're trying to turn those red dots into blue dots. Yes. Unserved, un uh, served. Um, so it's not engineering or feasibility studies, it's wires. At the, the, they can certainly use the money for those things, but at the end of the day, at the end of the project, there has to be service available. So... Um, if, if someone sought um, funds purely for an engineering study and there was no guarantee that at the end of that study there would be broadband within a year. We give, we give providers one year to mm -hmm. uh, provide broadband with slight exception that if they experience make-ready delays that we will <laughs> extend, um, we will ex extend the project. Uh, time frame, but um, there has to be, they, and we don't pay until there's service. So Consolidated does a project, <coughs> they need to certify that there is indeed broadband service available to those particular addresses of at least 10 megabits per second down one up at the end of the project. And last, unless you have another yeah, I, well, one, more. one clarification question there. Uh, if an entity comes in and says, uh, we'd like to do this project to expand, extend broadband out, but it's 
but it's on the lower end of the, uh, of the spectrum for speed and all that. Um, can you require them to go to the next level up, for instance, instead of DSL, uh, to um, extend, you know, 10 one or greater? So they would have to propose um, project, and we take into account uh, the, the speed and technology, so the bandwidth used. So if you have um, a project in location A that is a thousand dollars in address, and it's the fiber of the premise over the DSL, but DSL provides an important service in areas where there is no other provider nearby. You've got no cable company that is even remotely close enough to extend, or there's no um, you know, EC Fiber or Kingdom Fiber option nearby. Um, so really, DSL is the only choice they have. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, th in that, which case, you would really say that would be OK. Th yeah, and, the, and um, that that's a lot of our state, so um, it, it can often be the most cost-effective option, and uh, you know we won't shy away from that because at least then these residents get some sort of usable broadband that uh, uh, that will uh, make their lives better and is you know obviously better than having no broadband at all. Um, it's just one small housekeeping wrap up. I don't believe legal counsel ever identified herself for the record. Oh, Sarah Aceves, A-T-E-V-E-S. Uh, I also, if, if you're interested, uh, I only brought one copy, but I do have a copy of our petition and the proposed rule, if you would like to keep them. You can give it to you, Sarah. Okay. Send that to you electronically, too, if that would be easier. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, what I would like to use this time for, um, just you know, kind of a half an hour that we have before lunch, um, my hope is that our committee can um, push forward with some broadband uh, legislation in the next, I'm going to say month, maybe that's three weeks, maybe it's four weeks. Um, we have a number of bills on the wall that address various broadband issues. Um, it's certainly a priority of the speaker and the governor as well. Um, and um, and it's, uh, um, yeah, and actually, I think a number of people in this room. Um, in in that context, and especially because Representative Sevilla has done a lot of work on this, I asked her if she would start to pull together a list, if you will, of a number of the initiatives that are laid out in proposals and bills that she has introduced in the governor's um, proposal, um, some things that have been spoken uh, to by the speaker, so that we essentially can start as a committee to um, you know, start to generate some consensus, if you will. Um, and maybe there's not consensus, but we'll work through that in the coming weeks. On, here are the initiatives that are kind of on the board. And uh, let's take a look at those as um, things that we may include in a piece of legislation to cut here. And also, as there are things that um, we may want to add and, subtract, uh, add and subtract uh, from that list. But I would like to see our committee start to um, form around um, uh, initiatives that we would prioritize as um, starting to uh, push the ball down the field, if you will, in this issue area. Um, uh, there, this may take the form of a couple of different bills. Uh, there may be things that, uh, that we decide for strategic reasons would best be handled in a unique piece of legislation. Um, but I, I, I want to start to get all those things on the, on the, um, on the table, if you will. So, Laura, if you want to just lead us through some of those lists. Um, I was hoping Maria was going to be here. That was my mistake in not scheduling her for this time. Uh, you know, ultimately, um, Maria will be charged with, um, uh, you know, putting this into legislative um, form. 
but um, at any rate, we, we can work through that. Uh, in so that is my uh, oversight, and, and that's kind of here. Maybe she'll be able to turn up. Uh, it's it's like magic. Um, <laughs> Maria, I, I I apologize that I did not um, reach out to you and schedule time for this. Oh, no, so no problem. Um, what what I was just um, laying out to the committee is what I would like to do in the near term, and I've asked uh, Representative Sevilla to lead us through this. Is there are a number of proposals, both on our wall from the governor, things that we've talked with the speaker about. I would like to start us to um, get those ideas on the table. Um, and certainly, uh, folks around the table are welcome to, to add and suggest subtractions from that list to work our way towards one or two pieces of legislation that we will be molding and hopefully um, acting on as a committee in the next, uh, I'm going to say, three weeks. Um, so with that, uh, as an introduction, I'm going to let um, – and you're welcome to sit at the table if you'd like and or wherever you want to sit to take notes. and. Helps along in this process. Yeah, um, and, and I'm kind of making notes on this as yeah. well. But okay, starting up here. Okay. Yeah. Again, so I, believe I have here. two bills um, conceptually uh, drafted out. One is the Vermont Universal Service Fund bill. Um, and what does that do? H94, and that bill, uh, the one that we have right now, raises the USF. Half a percent, so that's 1.6 million. There's a current allocation in there for a million dollars for feasibility studies um, and that type of work for um, CUDs or other um, startups. Uh, that allocation, I think, with, uh, having spoken with a number of folks, probably needs to come down. So there probably need to be adjustment. But this is just raising in general uh, so 1.6. So that would take the current. Um, Vermont Universal Service Fund fee from 2% to 2.5%. Yes. It would do that for four years. Four years. And um, what that bill prescribes is that that money be used specifically, um, is used for the Connectivity Fund? I can't remember. Connectivity Initiative. Yeah. Right? That's the Connectivity no. Fund. Yeah. Fund. With the exception that a million dollars of the amount raised is set aside for feasibility studies, right. and that's either a million dollars every year right. or a million dollars over the four-year period. Right. And so that's basically a fundraising vehicle to fund some of the rural some of the rural broadband yeah. stuff that we're talking about here. Um, as part of, um, you know, just as part of... One more question about yeah. that. And so that earmark mm -hmm. gets away from it, the connectivity initiatives requirement that it end up in cable being, ends up in... Connectivity initiative requires that addresses be connected at the end of the project. But, but you have a money set aside which could be for studies that don't necessarily it result adds, in connectivity yeah, it, in a year. Yeah, uh, right. Yes. It adds an additional and I and what I what I said is I think that amount is gonna have to be adjusted, adjusted. for what is proposed. Yeah. I think it's probably too high. Um, and so we're doing some work on that. Um, was part of that discussion. So the governor has also proposed, um, I don't think this would be included in that bill, but he's proposed a one-shot um, investment in the connectivity fund of um, just under a million dollars. Um, 955,000. Um, uh, we also have a bill up here on the wall, H145, which deals with the post sale language. Uh, that Clay was talk, just talking about in terms of that hole that's been opened up in the Vermont Universal Service Fund of between four and 600,000. Um, and uh, Chuck Storo, who is not in here, has a well-rehearsed presentation that he could kind of explain um, how, how that um, would work as, as could Marina. So there's one bill, Vermont Universal Service Fund bill, looking to raise um, by a half a percent um, including some funds for feasibility studies for rural, um, either municipalities, startups, or CUDs, um, and additional funds into the connectivity initiative and high cost. So we'll get a split in there. Um, and then uh, also just thinking about these funds that the governor has put in. So that's the Vermont Universal Service Fund bill kind of dealing with it on its own and sending it out, um, which we would take a lot of testimony on. Clarifying 
yeah. question again. The 145. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> doesn't actually change the amount of revenue, right? It just changes applies, who's paying. Changes who's paying. Yeah. Okay. And and mm -hmm. right now it looks like no one's going to be paying if we don't change who's paying because it was AT and T. Guess who? Yeah. Um, then looking at a bigger kind of broadband omnibus bill, and including in there uh, the Vita loan pieces, which are in 160. Is, uh, it, is this a bill or is this sorry? Yeah, this is so, so this is yeah. what this will do is pull in the first one will pull in a couple of bills, so the Vermont Universal Service Fund, it'll pull in on 94 and uh, 145. Okay. And the second bill will pull in um, 160. So these are elements that the governor proposed, VITA, which we may make some changes to. Uh, the bonding, which is um, general obligation bonding uh, proposal from the governor. Uh, we need to have a discussion about uh, human resource assistance for um, municipalities as part of this. So we're thinking about how we can help municipalities, CUDs, startups um, move through this process and solve the problem of unserved um, Vermonters. There needs to be some additional help for them, whether that's in state government or outside of state government. It's a contract position, but there needs to be some sort of personnel. Uh, we also have uh, a more kind of longer term, less urgency, um, H95, which is the feasibility study, elect, uh, having the Department of Public Service look at electric companies and broadband internet access service. As part of that feasibility study, We may consider um, some pilot study work that has been not pilot work that has been done. We may want to, uh, as well as a possible um, broadband commission, um, something that sits uh, maybe outside of government and has some legislative um, bodies. On it. And so that's kind of where we are at right now. As part of this, for those of you who have not gone through, uh, we would have, I would envision we would hear a lot from VLCT. We would hear a lot from the startups in Vermont, so like an EC Fiber. Um, we would hear, obviously, from all of the providers, um, the, the wireless providers, cable companies, we would hear from Consolidated, we would hear from the independent phone companies, um, we would hear from utilities, Velco, uh, we would hear from VLCT and um, and uh, perhaps Viper, perhaps AARP, folks who are representing um, the Vermonters who are being injured uh, by the current state of affairs uh, and who are being put at risk by the current state of affairs. And I think we would probably hear from the treasurer's office maybe on the bonding. Uh, uh, we would definitely hear from Christine Halquist. I think she's scheduled. She, she, she's not today, is she? Yeah. Yeah. She's today, excuse me. Yeah, so we'll hear from Christine Halquist today. <laughs> so this proposal that we have on the electric utilities um, this has come from Virginia legislation, but of course it's a concept that Christine had talked about on the um, um, campaign trip. So I think that's, yeah. is that okay? It is. Okay. Um, so and I, I, I want to um, pull this together even more, um, which is uh, Laura had talked about initially um, two funding mechanisms. One that is in the governor's budget currently, which is uh, $955,000. Another funding mechanism, um, not related, but potentially additional money, would be uh, raising the um, <coughs> Universal Service Fund fee from 2 to 2.5% two for four years, which would raise, I can't remember the number, 4 to $6 million over those four years. Um, so that would, be, that would be additional money on top of what the governor has proposed. 
It's something that the House has passed for the past several Two years. Um, the Senate, that's something that's gotten caught up in the Senate, just to, again to give some history on this. Um, uh, one of the things that um, I, uh, well, I'll speak for myself, that um, as we look at what towns, CUDs can actually do to help themselves, if you will, one of the initial um, functions that they have to go through is a feasibility study. Mm -hmm. Again, whether it's a, a group of municipalities working together, whether it's um, an individual town, they, there's a number of things that they have to look at, um, from engineering to uh, kind of looking at the market that they're in, to reviewing what other options are beyond building their own broadband system, working with incumbent providers. There are a number of things that, that um, these groups have to look at. That's kind of the first step. Those studies, those feasibility studies, cost on the order of fifty or sixty thousand um, dollars, which are challenges for you know these local um, uh, governments or, or CUDs to come. Volunteers, up with. right? So one of the one of the um, uses of this of this funding would be to go to help um, locations around the state who are looking to embark upon that process. Um, some of this funding would be used for those feasibility studies. Um, all of the money that uh, the governor is putting out there, that if, if we were able to raise additional revenue from the from a, um, universal service fund, would not be used for feasibility studies. It would be additional money that could go into um, the um, connectivity con initiative. Thank you, the connectivity initiative, which could be used for. Um, you know, extending uh, broadband or improving telecom services. That fund, uh, as Clay just presented to us, is um, is not a robust source of funds uh, for this at that point. So this would go to um, uh, uh, building the reserves in that fund for that for this initiative. So that's kind of the funding piece. Um, you know, and there's a question of do we include all this in one bill or have those things um, separated out? Yeah. Okay. Just a suggestion that as we're working on uh, uh, deciding what to put in, yeah. as we're actually working on the legislation, I think it would be good if we had a, a straw poll of the committee in terms of whether we support yeah. these things so we can tell the other committees even before we yeah. have put it in language. And the money, I'm talking about the money committee. Yeah. And, and um, what I'd ask Laura to do, which is kind of laid out here, is these are bullet point things of, of, of initiatives that are out there on our wall in the governor's um, uh, list of initiatives. So, yes, yeah, this is a starting point. This is not this is what's going to be our, in our bill. We've got to collectively decide that, I think. Um, and then kind of the, the second group, uh, the, 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 the VITA initiative, which is part of the governor's um, proposal, the bonding initiative, which is part of the governor's proposal. Um, uh, you know, I think those are fairly concrete. And we would certainly need ACCD to come in here and talk more about that and maybe about um, the concept of uh, the human resource that uh, Laura had talked about is um, this is something that has come from feedback that Laura has gotten, that I've gotten from BLCT, from some other groups of when a CUD or a group of municipalities or a town is considering um, uh, solving this problem on their own, like, it, like EC Fiber has done. Um, there's a question of how does that group go about it? Um, do they recreate the wheel? Um, what is the resource that they can reach out to in state government to help them not replow ground that has been plowed 15 times? or three times um, from groups that have been successful. Um, you know, there are, there are a variety of things that a select board or a CUD board has to go through that you know, are, are relatively complex issues. Is there a human resource or a clearinghouse that a CUD that's newly formed can go to to understand precisely what the steps, starting with a feasibility study, has to be gone through in order to get from point A to 
turning on broadband and CUD. And instead of having different municipalities and CUDs kind of recreating the wheel all over the state, is there a resource, whether in state government or outside of state government, that can assist um, these entities in getting through that process? Um, that, that's kind of the concept of a human, res a, a human resource. Um, and again, that could, res you know, that could reside inside of state government, maybe at ACCD, maybe at um, uh, the Public Service Department, or potentially that's an out, a, 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 a non-governmental um, resource. And the, the, the feasibility of the, of the utilities is, is essentially um, something that's, that's on the wall here. I would say, um, just to, and I maybe should have started with this, the intent of this, we have a sense, we have, we have a problem that is opening up in rural Vermont of increasing vulnerability. We have a deterioration that I do not expect to get better. Um, and you will hear, those of you that are new in the building, having gone through this with the Vermont Universal Service in the past and other broadband proposals, all of the telecom community, all of the telecom companies, um, all and the phone companies, who virtually all of them are also suing us right now, um, will find you and they will say to you, we love this idea, just don't compete with us. So what they mean is just do the last mile. Just do the very la the most expensive, hardest things. Don't do any of the others. Um, um, that may be hard to do in some of these rural towns um, where there's not um, where there's not much there. So I would expect you will get badgered quite a bit, freshman, um, quite a bit. But right now, the whole industry is changing. Um, and this is this is no longer an amenity. This is about this is about life, like modern life. This is about healthcare. This is about education. education. This is about being able to call for help. I mean, in my in some of my towns, I'm really worried about them being able to consistently call. For help. And so we need to have you know we need to um, modernize our telecommunications infrastructure and make sure that people are connected. So this is kind of a catalog of ideas, again, mm -hmm. off this board and from the governor's, uh, some, of the go some of the things that the governor has brought up in terms of funding. And, um, actually, funding in terms of real dollars and funding in terms of uh, VITA and bonding. Things. So this is a starting point. Um, and uh, you know, I, th I think we start, uh, we need to start to kind of hear ideas around the table of of you know, what to add here, what to subtract, as we start to build our way towards a piece of legislation. And as Laura said, we're going to be seeking testimony and ideas from a lot of different people over the next three weeks as, again, as we try and um, move towards something that we would uh, vote out of here. Exactly. Just from a practical perspective, yeah. uh, does that mean we take one of these and make it a strike ball and put everything into one? Um, That's one path where we can do a committee bill. Um, uh, I, even though it's past the debate for whatever. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I would, I'm going to kind of defer to Maria to, you know, what mechanisms are available to, to do that. Either of those options. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we could do either of those. And, and one of these... Which bill is the governor's proposal? Uh, 160. 160. Yeah. So, I mean, that's got a lot of this stuff in here, and, um, you know, the, that could be a starting point. Oh. But we've, we've got a pretty open field in what we do there. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I'm thinking about is uh, the interplay of, of cell service and, and, and broadband. Um, what you're talking about, Laura, is, is, is people not having copper deteriorating and people not having access to, to, to voice calls, really, to, to be able to call for help. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like a, a, a cell phone problem. I mean, it would also be solved by broadband, but it, it seems like it would be more quickly and, and uh, efficiently, maybe cost-effectively solved by, by better cell phone service, which could also, which, which could also uh, provide broadband. I mean, 
know, if it's if it's robust enough, right? So I I'm, I'm, guess I'm what I'm wondering is um, how those how you see those things or how we see those things uh, interacting um, and whether um, thinking about fiber to um, to village centers and, 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 and enhanced cell phone service for out, outside village centers might be the sort of more immediate path. So I would, I would just say to you, I think there are infinite number of ways sure. that this problem can be solved so that every Vermonter is guaranteed to be able to call for help. They have a backup. So if the phone line goes down, mm -hmm. they can call for help. There are infinite ways. Um, and I can tell you personally, I have asked all of the providers to help us think about what those might be. And in rural Vermont, they are running out of time mm -hmm. for us to come up with a solution mm -hmm. or for the providers to take care of this problem. And so what I have started to frame out, and, I, and it can only be improved by all of you, is how do we throw municipalities or groups of municipalities a lifeline? Right, So, and, uh, and that's part of the CUD. Yeah, the, the idea here is that uh, the incumbent providers, whether they be cell phone providers, whether they be um, copper lines, mm -hmm. whether it be cable, cable broadband, mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't want to speak for a while, but have not gotten to a point where um, coverage and service is adequate. Right. Um, in many ways, we are constrained from uh, mandating that that coverage be more adequate. Mm -hmm. And um, we are at a point where, to some extent, municipalities and CUDs as they form are, I don't want to say on their own, but in some cases have to solve their own problems. Mm -hmm. And a question of how can we in state government better enable them to do that. Right. Um, we can find five hundred million dollars, um, and you know, to solve the problem statewide. Um, short of that, are there other things that we can do to better enable local towns, um, CUDs, to? Um, solve their own problems. Well, so that's what I'm wondering about. That's what I'm wondering, right, whether um, incentivizing cell phone towers might not be the fastest fastest path to, 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 to the immediate problem that you're talking about, which is uh, being able to get people a dial tone when they need it. Um, and, 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 and also, if, 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 if there's sufficient uh, capacity on it, on the cell phone tower, that, that would also provide some kind of broadband. So that's that, I guess that's what I'm what I'm what I'm wondering. And I'm not an expert in this at all. I'm just I'm asking questions. I don't have an answer. <laughs> no, it's the right question. Yeah. Um, so two two thoughts. One is just uh, <clears throat> I would love to see the uh, electric utility and broadband broken out via standalone uh, because I think that that would move without some of the debates that the funding mm -hmm. uh, would agenda. Yeah. Uh, so that's just a preference there. The other is kind of tying into the ongoing discussion about public safety and that, that need for connectivity. And I'm feeling like there's a fundamental rethinking. As the technology landscape has changed, our definition of connectivity hasn't really changed. And it seems there's a, a fundamental rethinking that has to happen, and I don't know what it is. But, you know, I have fiber optic, so I have great connectivity unless the power goes out. And then I have a battery for an unspecified amount of time. But I hear a lot from people in, in a similar situation that, you know, they used to have a connection that they now don't have. And there's been a, in the upgrade, there's a new problem created. And so, you know, what is it that we need to provide to Vermonters? Is it cell? Is it, you know, it, is it a signal of some kind under most conditions as opposed to um, a copper line or, you know, I, just, I, I don't know. I'm yeah. not sure where to go 
with this. Right, and that's the, I, I think that's a, those are great questions, and then, then I guess the um, the follow-up I would have is, you know, as a uh, as a democratic form of government that does not control <laughs> you know, the wheels of commerce, you know, what are what are incentives that we can put in place um, to achieve those, things? or or you know, what are direct um, mechanisms we can put in place um, to support, uh, you know, again, uh, public safety um, issues that we want to make sure as a, you know, first priority of need are, are dealt with. And FirstNet is a huge piece of this, which we haven't really talked about yep. yet. With, it's a huge informational piece. It's not one that has a lot of levers. So right. that right. concerns me just about how much time we spend trying to pull, find levers to pull on there. And I'll just um, mention one more thing with regard to H95 and, and where, where that falls in here. Um, as Laura and I have talked about this kind of on the side, um, you know, clearly funding mechanisms and dollars uh, attract more oftentimes attract more attention and this was kind of the question is this two bills as opposed to having all this together to give members around this table as well as ultimately um, 150 members um, who are going to be taking a look at this to consider funding mechanisms um, aside from policy mechanisms and that's a question it's a question for this committee to, to cogitate on but you know, and that's why I was saying, you know, does this take the form of a couple of bills or one bill? And I think your point's a good one, which is, um, you know, there are some things we might want to consider separately. And um, just in my intellectual organization, I thought of that as funding relative to um, our policy. I have a question for Laura about the um, uh, universal service fund, yep. two to two and a half percent, yep. uh, has died in the Senate. But my impression has been that it's not hasn't died because of opposition to it. It's been lumped with other things which died. No, it was a standalone. It was a standalone at all times. Yeah. Okay. So and this is for the correction. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, you know, I feel a little bit better about it in the Senate this time. We'll see. So um, I, I agree that. 95 could be taken separately. I also include 93 with that. Yes. Thank you for bringing yes. that up. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, because both of those things are, uh, mm -hmm. especially since 93, 93 seems to have the uh, support of the department. Yeah. Um, the other thing uh, I was going to bring up is that they did that um, drive, drive around study to find out what coverage there really is. Yep. And I think that's going to have an impact on. Um, on whether we get additional funding for cell service. It's not uh, us. Huh? It's, it's not whether we get funding. No, not whether we get funding, <coughs> but whether we get funding from the federal, well, whether it's uh, the Farm Bill or, or whatever, that, and whatever that is. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what the uh, timeline is on finding out you know, what the results of that will be, but uh, then what things the way they are in Washington, who knows what will ever, yeah. what uh, will ever happen. The <laughs> question I would have on that is, um, is, there a, is there a legislative action for us to take there? That's my question. I mean, I think yeah, that is and, a, and, that is and, a and I don't know whether we need to take a legislative action there or wait for things to happen indefinitely. It might yeah. be helpful to have a update on the um, significant amount of funding through the USDA Reconnect program that has been made available. Much, uh, many census blocks in Vermont are ineligible because of ETA, but there are some that are eligible. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe having the Department of Public Service come in and talk about that. Although there's no action, it's more right. informational. You know, if you if you think about all the programs and everything that all the providers are going to tell us, you know, this problem is going to get solved, you know, in 2050. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I think it is important, you know, that our caucus, I think, opposed the increase in the U.S. universal service. I don't think you did. Some of us did. Some of you. Um, but again, to say that it's going to end in four years, 
you know, the property transfer tax is a good example of something that doesn't sunset. So mm -hmm. I think people have to go into it realistically. And that's, that's just a comment for yep. trying to sell something. So, to, so um, not to eat too much in your lunch time. Uh, the idea, and just kind of laying this out and starting to get some additional feedback, is this is going to and and um, this deserves and needs more feedback and cogitation by this committee in the coming weeks. I think I'm going to start to build our committee time in the next three weeks, pulling in testimony from people who are interested in, in some of these initiatives, and there's going to be lots, um, to, to start to get that feedback to work on and to adjust uh, you know, some of these ideas. Um, but this has got to be a work in progress. And it's going to be, yeah, I, Can I just, um, I just, um, and I could have missed it, obviously, yeah. with my, um, not being here in recent days, um, but the um, um, the um, situation that Laura is talking about uh, with regard to rural Vermont and landlines is there a document that has been submitted to us that actually outlines this problem? I mean, I'd love to take your word for it, but I want to make sure I really truly understand that there is a problem and if, and how big it really is, because I I just um, is there I, I haven't heard. Yeah. In, uh, in my areas yeah. of rural Illinois County, for example. So there's a um, service so. quality investigation that's open. I don't know to what extent we can take, we can provide information in here I would about just, what's happening. I would not just to say, but I would like some testimony that really outlines what the problem is. Yeah. If there's if there's a significant problem or not, mm -hmm. or if it's just something that can be yeah. done very easily. If it's one town or something, if it's, um, unique, to if it's unique to a particular area, I don't want to be over over exaggerate any problems that we might. Have we already have enough problems? I don't think we need to. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. How, how many cell towers would it take? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the state does own cell towers. So. And we need. We're going to need cell towers for first night. <coughs> so. so. Sorry. So, so do you have a similar uh, process and time frame in mind for uh, energy related stuff? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just no. Okay. I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but we will. We'll push it. Okay. We will. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember when we had this discussion, but. Um, uh, in the next week, um, we have this ADS bill, which I'm hoping is not going to be controversial. Um, we need to give feedback to the Ways and Means Committee on a funding mechanism for PUC and um, Department of Public Service. We need to finish our recommendation on that by next Thursday. Um, we're going to be doing some work on this. And then um, I believe by tomorrow, we are, as you're more familiar with than anybody here, we're going to get a letter from the Appropriations Committee asking for feedback on a number of um, funding proposals, kind of in our policy bailiwick, that are in the Appropriations Committee. One of them, um, the Governor's uh, Connectivity Fund thing, I'm sure, is in there. Um, so that is kind of our full plate, I would say, for the next you know, two or three weeks. We are going to try and keep folding in uh, energy things as well. Um, absolutely. But this is what I would say is our immediate priority. Okay. There we go. Um, we're meeting at 1. 1 is house floor. Oh, house floor. Oh, yeah. yeah. The fun yeah. continues. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Christine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm guessing we're going to have a couple of folks um, moving in here from the floor. If um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself for the record, and um, we're going to record the hearing, and um, and we'll let you take it from there. And let me ask you um, ahead of time: um, Do you mind if, if members have questions? And I'll direct that to you. If, if we um, ask questions during your presentation, would you prefer to wait to the end? It's totally up to you. No, I think uh, ask ask during the presentation. Okay. I, I plan on basically. 
you know, less than 15 minute presentation. Okay, great. And, uh, and uh, it had a good time for questions. Okay, terrific. That's Happy way, please. Okay, so uh, anyway, my name is Christine Hulquist. I, I, uh, I've spent uh, at least 18 years looking at broadband, starting in 2000, actually when Tim Nolte from uh, Burlington Telecom came and approached me and said we should roll out fiber to all the homes and businesses in rural Vermont. And of course, you know, I've done the, the spreadsheets and the, and the, and the, the cases uh, for years and years and years, and I've looked at every technology that exists, so I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about the technology, but I'm going to talk about the technology in the presentation. But if you look today, where we are today, the premise that I think you know, many people understand today, and I, talk, I certainly talked about it during my campaign, is I honestly believe Vermont cannot grow if we don't, can, if we don't have tele, strong telecommunication services in rural Vermont. It's, I, worked at, uh, I worked for 10 years at the national level, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. They're the organization that's responsible for fighting electricity to all of rural America. This is the top issue for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association as well. There are co-ops nationwide, there's about 60 of them right now look, put, that are actually in, in the process of putting fiber to every home and business. There's about 989 co-ops uh, countrywide. Um, those co-ops that have done it have, have successfully turned their, their economies, even in coal country. So it's, it's, uh, there, are t there are use cases, and I, and I have a use case for you here as well. But I, I, the first quote I'm going to lead off with is from one of my favorite heroes, FDR, who was the founder of the rural electric cooperative movement. What I, what I believe is one of uh, humankind's greatest accomplishments. We connected every home and business with electricity in America, even though the business case didn't support it. And of course, his quote is, if, you can't, if you're not getting it done with a private utility, do it, do it through the government, um, which, is, uh, which is how the cooperative system was formed. And you know, one of the uh, one of those crazy news services when I was running uh, asked me about socialism. Well, you know, you look at you look at a cooperative. A cooperative is a pretty socialist system, but it's certainly uh, driven some of the some a whole heck of a lot of capitalism in rural America. So, so infrastructure is key. And you know, I don't I don't know when you know or where infrastructure became a socialist activity. But it's certainly what spawns growth in America. We're actually spending only, only about half of what we spent in the 60s on infrastructure as per our gross domestic product dollar this year. So, you know, I'm going to talk about the electric grid of the future. This really starts with this is a critical infrastructure that the electric grid is going to require in order for us to get 100% renewable 100% of the time. And I'll talk about that. I'm going to talk about why I'm so bullish about fiber optic infrastructure. The technology comparisons, which you'll see why I'm so bullish, and uh, I'll talk about fiber optic and telecommunications, the advantage of using the regulated utility for open access fiber, some of the legislative considerations, and some of my final thoughts. So it's the bridge to the future fiber. Our economic development depends on it. If you look at speeds, access speeds today, today the average access speed for an urban area is 70 megabits per second. And if you compare that with those of us in rural Vermont who can get lousy internet service, we get seven, one-tenth of that, seven megabits per second download, one upload. One is one-seventieth of what the urban folks get. We're competing with the cities for our business. That's expected to grow to 200 megabits by 2020, 1,000 megabits by 2028. That cannot be done with any other technology but fiber optic. Just for example, Netflix, one Netflix show HD requires 25 megabits alone. So we're kind of being left in line, uh, behind in America right now. America is about 10th in the world in terms of, of speed, access speeds. We're about 26 within that 10th. So we're pretty far behind. You know, We're some, somewhere around Slovenia in terms of third world. Um, fiber is to promise the ultimate solution. It's been around a long time. It's future proof. It's just like an electric wire. It doesn't degrade. Um, and you know, some people have said to me, and this, you know, look at, you just gotta remember your physics. Some people say, well, somebody might come up with something more advanced. Sorry, I don't know anything right now that goes faster than the speed of light. <laughs> so and w when we find that, then we'll probably be teleporting to different worlds. So I, I, look, I look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so getting to this future of, uh, I'm gonna say, 
the infrastructure is, if, if we want to get to 100% renewable 100% of the time, it's going to require a, a, a rely, the reliable connections that fiber will give us. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through all these words here. I kind of threw this in for your, your education, but, but because it uses light, it's the fastest speed. Um, if you look at um, one, the miracle of fiber, one single strand of fiber, smaller than your human error, can, uh, can tr transmit, it can be split into 100 wavelengths and allowing recorder speeds of 13 terabytes per second. That's what Facebook plans on with its fiber, 13 terabytes per second. That's 13,000 gigabytes per second. Um, and Nokia has a technology to bring it to 32. The technology kept, kept splitting and splitting and splitting uh, in terms of uh, speeds. Uh, you know, people think of it as a new technology, but it's around since the late 80s. Let's talk about why I argue for regulated utility ownership as, as an infrastructure. The reason I argue for regulated utility ownership is because it's so much less expensive than the way we're doing it today. First of all, an electric utility, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically regulated and, pr and protected by the public service commissions, they get to borrow at the lowest rates in terms of uh, in infrastructure. They do infrastructure. Electric utility life is 30 years twice that of telecom companies. Um, so just by the nature of your regulated utility owning the fiber, you cut the actual costs in half. And uh, some, sometimes they've get, gone as far as 40 years. But that's all the Public Service Commission. Sorry, Christine, um, can you clarify? When you say electric utility life, what, what do you mean as opposed to life of telecommunication? What, what I mean is when, when we, with an electric utility, you, play, you replace your infrastructure over a 33-year period, where a telecom, they, so it's the depreciation rate. So that becomes the real cost for the consumer. It's what you're paying for the infrastructure. So think of your home. You know, if you take a 20-year mortgage versus a 10-year mortgage and what your payment is going to be. So, so it's not based on the actual lifespan of the infrastructure. It's based on depreciation. It's based on depreciation, except the okay. depreciation rates Thank as well. Um, so uh, Placing, placing fiber in the electric space eliminates the expensive make-ready costs. Make-ready is what, the, today, because we have, uh, because the telecom is, is outside the electric space, um, that, that allows them to use non-certified uh, field workers. Uh, they, they're not, not, they're not first-class line workers. Um, but that also, because, the, and the reason for that is because of the electrical hazards that are involved with high voltage. Um, but you have to keep your telecom 40 inches away from the neutral, which means when you introduce a new telecom wire, you have to do all this work on the poles, and that cost goes directly to the telecom provider, which increases the cost of the consumer. But if you hang it in the electric space using, using your certified uh, first-class line workers, which you know, we have all over the, all over the country today, um, as part of, that's what they do. They pull wires. And, and fiber is just another wire. Um, can we ask a question along the way? Or, or, yeah, sure. Um, so you, we were just talking about this make ready uh, earlier today. And when uh, somebody who's running fiber wants to, wants to add um, that to a pole, um, all the other utilities have to move their lines down. Because That's the right. phone, ha phone line has to be the bottom, the bottom right. line. Yeah. So what you're suggesting is uh, by having uh, electric utility line, work line workers uh, string fiber. They could string it in that 40-inch space. Yep, it, it actually be, it actually is. We when we started doing this in 2003, you know, I was working on a project with uh, called Northlink. We actually hung it uh, right below the neutral. Um, you could actually hang it from the neutral as well, which saves money. Uh, fiber, by definition, it's, it's it's what's called all dielectric, which means there's no metal in it, which means you can place it right on the wire if you have to. In fact. Some of the transmission utilities have fiber built right into their transmission wire. Hmm. And there's a lot, of, I'll get to that, there's a lot of fiber that exists today within the electric utility infrastructure. Um, and today, you know, the biggest cost, you know, this used to drive me nuts. I'll just use, use a story to tell this story. We got two separate companies trying to maintain the same infrastructure. I would be up there as CEO of Vermont Electric Co-op during a major storm. We'd send a bucket truck up to Canaan, Vermont, which I'm, I'm, raise your hand if you know where Canaan is. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. See it on the map. Yeah, we. I don't know who's there. <laughs> we would send a bucket truck up to Canaan, 
to restore three spans of wire. And then, of course, Fairpoint now consolidated. They'd have to send their bucket truck up. I'm thinking, why are we paying for two truck loads with something that could be done in one? You know, very expensive. So, so you got two organizations trying to support a telecommunications infrastructure. And when, and what I'm talking about here is is driving down the cost of the infrastructure so we can get it out further. You know, when I uh, repeatedly when I've done the math over the years, the existing process, the way we hang telecom using a separate uh, uh, semi-regulated utility versus our regulated electric utility, the best you can do is get down to 12 customers per mile because of the infrastructure cost. Um, and you know, if you look at you know, look at Washington Electric Co-op, for example, they have 10 customers per mile. You'll get up to the 10 customers per mile. You, eight, eight, thank you, thank you. There you go. You, you, and, and you're down to four up in the Northeast Kingdom. So if you really want to get it to rural Vermont, you've got to drive the cost down. And the only and the, what I'm arguing about is, you know, we can cut the cost by 75 percent doing it this way, um, or greater. Um, I'll hit on some of the, legisl the legislative considerations that I think need to be addressed. Um, I think we need to establish language occurring uh, encourage, that encourages electric utility investments in the fiber backbone, really signaling the Public Service Commission. Establish the position of I think we need a Vermont State Broadband Manager working, and, and it should, I think it should work in the uh, Agency of uh, Commerce and Community Development. It is an economic development activity. And, the, and we have these various community utility districts throughout the state, but they don't have the technical resources to take on these issues. We really need somebody available to help to, uh, grow this, you know, support those, those communities that are, that are um, driving for this. Um, give the authority to set bulk data tariffs to the Public Service Commission. This is how we pay for our electric infrastructure today. You know, when, when we set an electric rate, part of that's the infrastructure cost. And you make assumptions based on that infrastructure cost. So the Public Service Commission would say, OK, we're going to invest x millions. It's going to be paid off for a 30-year period. We're expecting a 50% adoption rate. Here's, here's what the tariff should be. Now, if the adoption rates are higher, the Public Service Commission adjusts the price down. If they're, they're lower, they adjust it up. But 50% is a pretty safe number. That penetration rate's been exceeded all just about every use case we've seen across the country. That's a safe number. And I have talked to uh, in, in a cooperative bank, um, the cooperative banks, CoBank and CFC. They'll they'll invest on those numbers. Yes. Christine, I'm going to I'm way out of my depth on this bullet point. Um, does this suggest that? Um, and to the point where I don't know what bulk data tariffs are, but setting that aside for a second, d does this suggest that the rate case that a um, that a utility would be subject to would incorporate work that is done by that electric utility in the telecommunications service providing arena? So there would be a uh, a um, an intermingling of the business model, if you will. Uh, no, I would argue a, sep a separation of the business model. You know, you, you have, you know, you don't need to do, do, do you see what I'm, yeah. I don't know the, if I'm asking you know, the question we, correctly. You know, we, we, have, we would have charge codes. Okay. And, you know, the time spent on telecom would be charged X, uh, electric Y. And by the way, the, the data users will pay for the cost of the telecom, not the electric users. Now, you might argue, you know, that, and that would be up to the Public Service Commission. You know, if, if as we evolve in our technology, and I'll talk more more about that, is um, we'll, you know, there may be a percentage of that will that will be paid by the electric utility for the amount that's used for their electric utility infrastructure. Sure. But that's how rate rates are done today. You know, we we've, we've got experts who know how to do that. Okay. So, um, I got a question, Christine. So, what about competition? I mean, if this is all done by the electric companies, where is the competition? Well, so so let me get. I'm going to answer that question. I'll get back to that. So, um, so that, that's an important question. So um, exempt the fiber infrastructure for local property taxes. I know people are going to get all upset about that. But the point is, if you, this, this is an economic development tool. When you put that in place, you will get return on other taxes for that. My, I'm, I'm going to sit here and argue f uh, f in front of you about every possible way to drive down the cost of the infrastructure to make this possible. You know, you're you're gonna have to make the decision on what you have to do. So I'm just, you know, I'm just I'm, I'm just giving you a pie. I'm pie in the sky in here. I know that one's gonna be a little tough to swallow. But, <laughs> uh, I think that 
we, you know, we, we got this. We have a lot of fiber. We've got hundred at Vermont Electric Co-op. That was what I did. Fiber swaps, hundreds and hundreds of miles of fiber at Vermont Electric Co-op. Velco has fiber. Uh, GMP has fiber. That fiber has been paid for by the ratepayers. I would argue that that's public infrastructure. Um, now, Velco, you know, it, 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 their model is a separate, you know, for-profit utility. But I'd still argue we're paying for that. You know, this gets back to FDR's state. You know, that's we pay for that. We pay for the ratepayers. You know, that's that's uh, that's. Uh, I, and so now let's get to the competition part. Um, you know, we're, there's no there's no uh, reason to overbuild telecommunication companies' fiber. For example, VTEL has fiber. Waitsfield Telecom has fiber. If the fiber exists, then the bandwidth the capability exists. Um, what what I'm going to argue is some, somewhere in here I talk about this. I'm going to um, uh, maybe I don't, but I'm going to I'll say it here. I think I hit it later on. But point is, we're going to treat fiber just like we electric wire. Your 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 network connection is at the meter. So you know when we when we strang electric wire, we didn't tell you what appliances to buy. You know this is why I talk about this this socially owned infrastructure created so much opportunity for business in the home because people then went out and bought appliances and chose what they want. Same thing with fiber. Fiber responsibility ends at the meter, and then it's open access for any telecom provider. Mm -hmm. So you could get a telecom provider from Australia if you want it, because it's, 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 uh, they're, they're basically going to pay for the use of the existing fiber infrastructure that's part of the regulated utility. By the way, that cost could be less than what we're paying for the rotting copper infrastructure today because of, we've driven the cost down so much. Um, so I think um, we, you, we should make some clear, firm requirements for broadband minimums 100 megabits per second. That, by itself, will drive uh, the adoption of fiber, because there's not much other technology that can achieve that. And I'll talk about the technologies in a minute. Allow micro-trenching. Um, that's just being able to pull, you know, fiber doesn't need to be buried four feet like an electric wire. It can be 12 to 18 inches below the surface. Require all the pole assets to be sold back to the utilities at net book value for a variety of reasons. This is one of them. Um, but also, you know, we got this dual pole issue that that would take care of. Um, exempt electric utility fire from make ready requirements. Talk about that in attachment and encourage some pilot uh, projects. It, it, yeah. Yeah, why don't you go first? Can we do that? What's that? Require the poles to be sold back to the utility? Sure. Where's the legislature? Look at Steve who's in the room. I don't know. <laughs> Be bold. Be bold. Don't worry about the attorneys. <laughs> I, I, do I really know the answer? I don't, but you know, figure it figure out. I know it's I know it's happening in I, you know, I think the Public Service Commission can encourage it. We we, I, I actually sold our assets. So you can encourage. Yeah, yeah, you can encourage. I don't, I don't know how far you have to go, but yeah. Uh, well, just <laughs> my follow-up to that is, if they all went back to the electric companies, they'd be taxed to the towns, and a lot of the ones that the phone company owns aren't. So there'd be an additional tax on the electric company for those poles. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, so we take that. We can take that out of the electric rates. This is this something I, I don't know. What it's but it's about. So, the, so the, the poles are, are pay property taxes? Yeah, the poles pay property taxes. But I gotta believe the telecom people have to I think the telecom people have to provide I think that's that's gonna be a moot point because it's all paid for by the cost of the infrastructure today. Yeah, yeah. We I when I started at, at the co op I sold half of our pole assets to Fairpoint because we were desperate. We needed the money, we were kinda of, out of bankruptcy. Um, and then regretted it for the next seventeen years. And the towns lost money when you did that. I don't know that the answer to that. Yeah. So the, the yeah. telephone companies are exempt, yeah. but the electric utilities are not. Okay, so uh, just some final thoughts. It's a great case study. I think it's in Michigan, Midwest Energy and Communications. If you want to look that up and see, you know, it, you know, do the fact checking that I've been talking about. Um, here's an example of their costs. This is exactly what they're charging their consumers. 50 bucks a month for 25 megabits per second up and download. And if you want a gig, which a gig will do everything, you know, you, you, you can stream 50 parallel Netflix things at once. Okay. 
and you, you think about what people are paying today. You know, if I think about what I'm paying, you know, over $100 for my, for my uh, direct TV bill. I pay another $50 for my, my Wi-Fi, and then I have no idea what I'm paying for my phone on top of that. Um, but you know, you, we're all, all of us in rural America are paying more than that today, even for the highest speeds. Once you get speeds, you know, once you get these kind of speeds, you don't have to pay a phone bill. You don't have to pay. You wouldn't. There's no need to have a, a, a cable system because you can get it all online, and that's where it's headed anyway. I, you know, I do. I do respect the activities of the community. I want to talk briefly about the CUDs, um, community utility districts. But you know, the problem is they're working under an expensive model today. You know, I, it, no matter how you cut it, the way we do telecom today, it's once you get below 12 customers per mile, it does not pay. You can't create a, a, a use case, no matter how good you are as a CUD. It's 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 hard to create a use case for that. Um, you know, I I just say that you know, we, we got to get to the core of the of the cost here. Um, the, and I said the CUDs need centralized resources. There's 350 million dollars in funding in the current farm bill right now, um, and it actually will it'll actually pay for 90 up to 90 percent of the infrastructure costs. For, for rural areas that are uncovered today. Um, um, there's money in the Connect America Fund, and the utility uh, banks are willing to let up to 80% of the infrastructure costs for a well written planet, low borrowing costs. And I think, you know, my recommendation is, is put out an RFP for a good engineered telecom plan to make this happen. That's my, that's my presentation. Three fifty for all fifty states, or three fifty for three fifty for all fifty states. Yeah, yep. and it's yeah. So, and that money keep you know, every farm bill has money in it. So my point being, you know, get get someone to go after that money and use that as part of the down payment on the infrastructure. And that money is available to providers, right? Not to the state. Is that it's for providers. Yeah, it's regular. It's, regu it's available for regulated utilities. Yeah, I would argue the state can't do this because it's the model's too expensive. You know, where? Yeah. Yeah, I, I find this to be a very interesting concept. Uh, it's way above my understanding of how the technical issues would would uh, would be handled and the uh, the, the um, I don't know uh, the the ownership issues would be handled and everything and. Uh, so I could see probably a study to be conducted by the Department of Public Service on feasibility and the um, you know costs and benefits of that. Yeah, I would actually recommend. But I'm not, I'm not really sure what legislation we could actually. I mean, right other than that. But I would recommend so. the Agency of Commerce and Community Development do the study. Are there, are there specific things that are um, prohibiting, um, you know, one level, are, are prohibiting um, electric utilities in the state of Vermont from doing this? And then I guess an addendum question would be, um, would you um, segment in that prohibition, if one exists, co-ops relative to investor-owned utilities, um, just from a corporate structure standpoint? Um, I, I, I haven't read enough about this to be knowledgeable, um, which means I've read headlines. But I, I know that there are some states that are working on um, freeing up the ability for co-ops to do just this. Um, they haven't actually gotten through. Maybe some states have. Some states haven't. I know. Um, but in, in reading those headlines, I was, you know, what are the what are the things that are blocking um, a Vermont Electric Co-op from doing this today? Well, I think uh, you know. I think you, there's, there there needs to be some legislation to help them do this, and I'm not I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that is. There's really, they they could do it today, and they would you know if they if they were, in fact what as CEO of the co-op I was starting to look into this obviously, yeah. um, and you know I was ready to push the board in that direction, and we would work with the you know as a co-op we would work with the, the legislature to craft the right legislation to make it happen. So it it is an issue. Of, I believe it's an issue of will. Mm -hmm. It's because it's happening in other parts of the country, yeah. and Georgia and Arkansas have done have been passing um, encouraging legislation as well for this. Now, I don't think it needs to be restricted to co-op. You know, if you look at Green Mountain Power, 
Green Mountain Power is serving a lot of rural Vermont. You know, I think it's a it's a rural versus urban issue. It's a it's a fiber versus other issues. You know, and it's and um. So if I put my CEO hat on and my board of directors hat as a utility, you know, we're 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 conservative. You know, by definition, we have to be conservative. You know, we, it, it's uh, the market can be pretty harsh. If, you know, for an electric utility, and regulators can be pretty harsh. That's why you need encouraging legislation. You know, if you you know, it's it's got to be. It's if you are, are questioned for, for your investments, and you know, it, 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 we've seen it happen here in Vermont. You know, we almost put Green Mountain Power on a business many, many years ago for, for investing in Hydro Quebec. Um, so it's you know, it's it's um, so, you know, if you think about a regulated utility, by definition, if you step out, you get in trouble. So it's you know, we're, we're by definition conservative business. Um. So one of the, <clears throat> you know, we, we talk about fiber that uh, and 20 homes have access to it, but if the cost to connect is $5,000 to get from the street to the house, that's still prohibitive. Does, this reduces costs for the, the trunk line. Does it also, does it similarly reduce those connection costs? Yes, yes, absolutely. Today, today, what I'm, my, what I'm pointing out today, we have a very expensive model today, mm -hmm. and, and 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 following with some pretty expensive ways to do it. Um, you know, there's there's also been an enabling technology in the past seven years that's allowed utilities uh, to do this, which is called uh, portable splicers that go up in a bucket. You know, so some technology enhancements. But yes, today, currently, you know, the the user has to pay. And uh, you know what? It, and it can be very expensive because you're going to have to do all that make ready work, and you're going to put you know have a separate telecom company do it, and they have to make sure that they're cash flush. Uh, so yes, by definition, it becomes very expensive. That's that's what I'm arguing. Our model today is prohibitively expensive. What's to stop a company like Wastefield Champlain, uh, Wastefield? Telecom, telecom uh, Champlain Valley Telecom, from uh, contracting with, say, GMP to run fiber along its uh, electric lines right now, and then paying them for that. Well, I just I'm not sure GMP would want to do that. You know, that's it's it's just not it's just not a business that I think that that your utility. I mean, eventually, you know, you'll probably see your, the, this is happening across with co-ops mainly across the nation. Because again, speaking for the the, the co-op board, um, we we made this a priority. We know it's important for rural economic development. Now the investor-owned utilities haven't made it a priority, so I, you know, that's nothing. There's probably nothing that's going to stop them, but there's nothing that's going to encourage it either. Well, what about what about Wastefield Champlain Valley Telecom uh, contracting with Washington Electric Co-op? Well, they could do that as well, but again. The Washington Electric Co-op now has to make all the investments in the equipment and capital. So it's kind of like you think about the first person that comes along has to pay for all this infrastructure upgrade. You know, for example, Washington Electric Co-op wants to go out and buy the fiber splicers, get the, the line workers trained for a small population. So the cost for the initial startup will, be, will, will again be placed across the Waitsville Telecom incremental users, which probably makes the cost prohibitive again. It's you know it's, it's that's my point about trying to do this piecemeal. Piecemeal, the costs become high because you've got initial startup costs that that first person has to provide. This is why FDR, you know, signed the executive order saying we're you know we're gonna we're gonna socialize the electric infrastructure. Of this. Um, an answer, a further answer to the question about uh, obstacles and impediments. Uh, and I, I mentioned this at an earlier time. In most other states, um, electric co-ops and also municipal utilities are not rate regulated. They, they're subject to other regulation. In Vermont, they are. So it becomes very necessary to figure out and probably need some legislation for this level of additional activity um, to assure that the the, uh, the the costs and the rates are not commingled. That electricity is paying for electricity, and 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 fiber is paying fiber customers are paying uh, for fiber. Um, 
I mentioned in uh, Washington Electric Co-op um, many years ago, we explored getting into a uh, sort of auxiliary uh, energy-related business as well. And the biggest impediment was that we would essentially need to form a separate company in, yeah. or, in order to keep all, all of this uh, stuff separate. And I also just wanted to mention, because I, I mentioned this to Representative Brooklyn earlier today, I saw the, the president of the board of Washington Electric Co-op last night who informed me that that co-op board has in fact applied for some of the USDA no, money nice. here. Uh, I'm not sure exactly for what. I'm guessing that it's more for exploratory research and planning as opposed to implementing anything <coughs> at this point. But that, gonna, that's a change for them. Good. I'm going to take the chairman's prerogative to Pulling a friend here. If you want to. Hi there. <laughs> you I'm, want to. I, I, I'm giving testimony later. I can talk about okay, this in, 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 in more detail if you want to wait. Wait for me. Yeah, that's fine. If you okay. want to insert that later. And, and a, a, a comment slash question I have on that point, Aubrey, yeah. and, and maybe it's a question for you as well, Christina. Um, one of the advantages you highlighted here, which I think is a real one, an important one, is a cost of capital advantage. And I question if some of that advantage melts away. Um, as these business models are segmented, um, where you know one is more highly regulated, uh, more utility esque, um, and one is segmented out um, as a separate business model, maybe under a separate corporate entity, and can it avail, cannot cannot avail itself of as inexpensive capital as maybe the electric utility. Just a thought. I mean, I, I yeah, like I the idea, that's but that may be a yeah, challenge. Kind of get the punchline. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm wondering um, to what extent electric utilities need to run fiber anyway to manage the networks in the, in the, in, in the future of uh, distributed generation and microgrids and, and, and all that. I don't, I don't know the answer to, that, to this. I'm just wondering if, if there is uh, a synergy there. Well, there may be a synergy. I certainly wouldn't want to predict that. You know, I know uh, with Vermont Electric Co-op, when we chose our smart metering system, we chose the power line carrier because of the expense was low. You know, they're they're all you, you know by itself. There there may be you know I would I don't want to speculate too much about the future and what it brings. It depends how you know. There's so much that depends on uh, one of that being how how America. And right now, America's headed in the other way of building carbon rather than taking it down. So, you know, so, so if, if America does push for 100% renewable 100% of the time, then we're going to need more reliable connections. But that's not the direction our country's taking right now. Our country's drilling for more oil and doing all this other crap. So, um, so it really, you know, there's a lot of political dependencies there on whether you need that kind of bandwidth and reliability. You know, Green Mountain Power currently has an RF system. You know, RF is pretty unreliable, actually. I, you know, there, there was an article about in Georgia yesterday where they replaced their RF system with fiber in one of these dangerous quarters because it was RF. unreliable. Radio, radio frequency. frequency. Oh, yeah. for cell phones. For cell phones are radio frequency. Yeah. For reading the meters. No, for actually getting weather data from on top of their mountains and providing it and providing broadband through this uh, interstate that 80 percent of their. Um, well, is 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 is, 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 a, is a is a smart grid? Is that is that. Does, is fiber required for for a, for a smart grid? Is, is, well, the, and, 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 and and is a smart grid part of the resiliency that even a state, a small state like Vermont, would want to build into its system, um, anticipating uh, more weather events? I. We we're, Vermont is two tenths of one percent of the national population. We're one tenth of one percent of the electric load. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's. Uh, you know, do, do we, I don't know, it really, it really depends where the country's headed, right? You know, it's like, yeah, yeah it's just, yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Christine? Yes, yeah. um, If you're talking about uh, not doing any overbuild, but still utilizing that for smart grid, um, do you have anything in the plan about a, a cooperative agreement between the carriers who are covering everything that's already built? Um, that the electric utilities would have right of access for smart meters or anything? Uh, yeah, you're talking about cooperative relationships with existing telecom carriers? Right. Yeah, we work with telecom carriers all along to do fiber swaps and get more fiber, uh, but you know, no real long-term financial agreements. Okay. There's, there's, of course, you know, just like any other business, you know, you pay 
you pay for data connections, you pay for reliable fiber connections, telecom connections, but I wouldn't say that's any different than the other business, except you might need more. Great. Thank you. Yep. Very Thank interesting. You. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tomei. Thank you. Hey. I printed out a copy of my testimony for my own use. I know that you have it. Um, I don't know, but I I might want a map up there, which wasn't in the printed stuff. Can you uh, go to a, a website and bring sure. up a page? What would you like? Well, it would be ecfiber.net, uh, and then I think, it, I think it's called slash map. Thank you. Mm. Right. Good afternoon. Um, for the record, my name is Irv Tomei. I have been a resident of Norwich since 1975. Uh, I thought I retired in 2006. In 2008, as, the, uh, as EC Fiber was getting organized in the spring of 2008, my select board appointed me to represent our town on the governing board. And then a few years after that, somehow I became chair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I won't go into how it happened, but, <laughs> but I mean, I, it, I didn't ask for it. But uh, since that we hold, uh, the chair serves for one year term, we hold elections in May, and I have been um, re-elected several times since. Okay. Um, I, I, last week, it, it appeared to me that at least some members of the committee might like to have, yes, that's the map, thank you, that's right. <coughs> Um, it, that some members of the committee might benefit from an overview of what a communication union district is, uh, how it's formed, how it operates, uh, and um, some of the uh, advantages and potential limitations of a CUD. And so I've called my presentation Communication Union Districts 101, CUDs 101. I, before I start, I want to say um, that I and we'll, get, we'll probably get back to this in a later discussion, but I, I, I need to gently push back against some of the things that Christine Hawkins just said. Uh, our current bonds are 25-year bonds. We currently depreciate our fiber optic infrastructure over, uh, I, I think it's 30 years. And um, we currently offer, the speeds we currently offer, each, we offer four service levels to our customers. Um, they are all symmetrical. That is, you get the same speed up as down. And the upload speed is what you need to do serious work wherever you are, interact with the rest of the world. Uh, the commercial entities emphasize the download speed. That is an emphasis on entertainment delivery. It is not an emphasis on economic development. We offer 25-25, 50-50. 200, 200, and 700, 700, anywhere in our territory. And the map that's on the screen behind me, uh, it's an interactive map, but it shows where we now, except for the bright green, the bright green lines would be where we plan to be building this year. But these, this is where we now have service within our town. We started with just 25 miles. We now have 685 miles of fiber optic cable in service. That includes uh, more than 100 miles of leased dark fiber that is owned by the state of Vermont, was built by the Vermont Telecom Authority. Um, and we have more than 3,200 customers connected in now 22 of our 24 member towns, parts of, in some cases, the entire town is served. Did you say 685, of that 685, some of it is owned by? Some of it, we have long-term lease on fibers within a bundle, a cable that was paid for construction by the Vermont Telecom Authority. 
uh, when we have a, a long-term lease. Um, and, and the VTA cables, uh, this is another digression before I get started, but it's important to understand. Um, most fiber infrastructure in this state is either long range or so-called middle mile. It's analogous to Interstate 89 with an, in, with an exit ramp here and an exit ramp there. The VTA dark fiber infrastructure was designed from the outset to be usable also to deliver service to the premises it passes. Think of it as uh, Route 2 alongside 89 between here and Burlington. And that all happens in the single cable that's about the thickness of somewhere between my index finger and my thumb. Because there's 144 fibers there. But the fibers are grouped in bundles of a dozen. And so some of those fiber bundles a dozen at a time can be leased out to end user providers, such as, in our case, EC Fiber, or any other entity. Others are leased to companies like Fairpoint Now Consolidated to get their data from one town to another town. Uh, most of the fiber on the electric lines is not already designed for service along the way. So it's not a trivial idea to branch off, but that's a detail. Okay. Um, so now let me talk about communication in industries. CUDs uh, were created by uh, the Telecom Act of 2015, Act 41, and a CUD is similar to any other municipal union district, like a solid waste district, or a water district, or even a school di union school district. Uh, it's a, composed of multiple towns that have all voted, voted to be part of it. Uh, each town has representation on a governing board that sets policy and budgets and so on. Um, in a CUD, uh, each town's delegation, if they're present for the meeting, gets one vote, regardless of the population of the town they come from. It's very egalitarian. Uh, it is because it's a union district. The, the wonderful phrase in the, in the uh, legislation is, a body corporate and politic. That's a wonderful old phrase, and basically it means a union district is a virtual town. Under state law, under Vermont law, a, a union district of multiple towns is in effect a virtual super town. Uh, and in the sense its governing board is analogous to the select board of an individual town. CUD has most of the customary rights of powers that, any, that a town or a water district or a sewer district would have, or a waste district, except for two things. It doesn't have the right of eminent domain. That was in the original draft, and I said, no, let's not have it in there, because it will make a lot of potential voters, of the voters potentially unhappy, and we don't really need it. And two, and this reinforced the pro prohibition that was already in state law, that CUD cannot be supported from property taxes. It can't be supported either from taxes, tax money contributed by its member districts, nor can it levy a tax rate of, of its own on its member residents. So that is a huge difference from any other union, type of union district in this state. It can only borrow against future rev revenues, and when it goes out to borrow, it has to make it clear to potential lenders or investors that if it goes down, ultimately they might be able to take over ownership of the network it's built, but they have no recourse against the grand lists of the member towns. So it is that it cannot encumber its member grand lists. I just want to clarify one thing that you said, or that you found. My sense is that um, CUDs the financing has generally been revenue bond driven. It is revenue bond, yes. But you said 
Is there a prohibition against other type of borrowing by a CUD and um, other assets that um, well, could be it could against? borrow against its physical assets. It simply cannot borrow against the grant list of its yes. members. Okay. I would actually push back gently against one thing that Ted Brady said last week. Uh, he said, we assume that the fiber on the poles has no net value, uh, and I don't think that's true. I think that once you've got cable strung on poles, you do have an asset. In the last analysis, if uh, a CUD uh, were to go bankrupt, uh, then some entity would be glad to pay. Uh, well, look at in up in Burlington, uh, we, we don't we have many differences. Our structure is very different from Burlington. We don't have the same ex risk exposure that the citizens of Burlington had there. But uh, when Burlington Telecom did go bust, ultimately, uh, although maybe only 30 cents on the dollar was paid, a commercial firm was happy to buy the net. But normally, that, that's last recourse. Okay. So. Um, so why would you want to have a CUD? Well, I don't have to tell anybody that our towns vary enormously in disposable income, in population density, in all kinds of demographics. And it costs about the same per mile to build telecom infrastructure, regardless of how many people live on that mile of road and how much money they've got. When you pull together many towns, you have economies of scale in many ways. First of all, you're going to be picking up areas of higher concentration of customers and lower concentration of customers, so that your average population per mile makes a workable economic model. And incidentally, we aim for an average of five customers per mile, which is quite a lot fewer than Christine Hallquist was saying this, sir. Probably you'd like to have an average, we think that in our territory we've got an average of 14 premises per mile. We aren't expecting instant, instantly to pick up 100% take rate, and five customers per mile uh, works for us. Um, <coughs> So no, she said 14. Uh, she said more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just in in five customers per mile working for you, do you are your rates? Do they have to be approved by anybody? No, it's just no. you do no. what Tele you think people will. Telecom infrastructure is not <coughs> of this kind. Is not regulated. It's very distinct from telephone service. Telephone service is highly regulated. Uh, broadband connectivity is not regulated basically not hardly regulated at all. And when you, I, I mean, I'm assuming that if you extend a line with, uh, I don't know, 10 customers on it, that that helps. Oh, yes. Um, uh, we, that that, that lo lowers your overall per customer cost. Of course it does. Of course. And uh, we may, you know, another CUD with a different borrowing structure, I'll come, I'll come back to this later, about how our early our early uh, stages left us with more debt than a new CUD might have to have. But um, our base rate for that 25-25 service is $74 a month. We offer telephone on top of that through a technology called Voice Over Internet Protocol, VOIP. It's digitized phone. Um, uh, free calling anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, and, uh, except maybe Hawaii and Alaska, I'm not sure about that, uh, at $20 a month extra. That part's slightly regulated and is taxed. Mm -hmm. The internet part of it is not taxed. So um, our average revenue, I mean, people, uh, it's another 25 per month added to the 74 if you want the 50-50 rate. A lot of, and some people will take a higher rate than that. Our average revenue per residential customer is now uh, 104, 105 dollars a month. And, and I don't want to um, misdirect you here, but but uh, based on some earlier discussions we we're having today, is that 20 20 dollars on top of 75 dollars? Is that an accurate breakdown of actual costs, or is that? 
most of that what, twenty. What we're paying out charge? most of that twenty dollars to a third party that manages the phone service for us and delivers it through our network. So, um, I, I, I not, I'm not qualified to tell you precisely mm -hmm. the details. Okay. Uh, maybe I should explain right now. I was going to cover this later. Uh, the, the district, East Central Vermont Telecommunications District, does not itself have any employees. We have a contract with a, another entity, that ValleyNet it's called, that has a lot of telecom expertise. They have the staff. They have a staff of about 20, and they provide uh, customer service. They provide uh, installation. Uh, uh, they manage the people we contract with to string the fiber on the poles and uh, various other services. And, and they pay the bills of the building. Uh, ACE, <clears throat> but let me not get ahead of myself on that. I was speaking of economy of scale. Uh, I had a conversation, I hope you won't mind, Representative Sherman, we had a conversation last week, um, and, and you were speaking of Stowe's strong interest in maybe trying to go it alone. Well, no, uh, no I don't want to put you on the spot. A, <laughs> a question. A question. I, just, I, have, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, it is a reasonable question lessons. for a town with a lot of resources to ask. I think that the outskirts of a town, even a town that's very prosperous at the center, the outskirts of a town may have more in common with neighboring communities mm, than with the center. And when you design a network, from the beginning to serve a larger area, you can lay out your routes for efficient, for de deliver the service with a minimum mileage of cable and efficient branch points and so on. So that's one of the advantages. Another advantage is, uh, as I was saying to that Vermont Digger reporter who interviewed me last week, uh, Vermont, you know, there's a, Vermont is full of oddities, and one of the oddities is, is in the middle of a town that is generally poor, you may find somebody who's not poor at all. We all know this. They don't dress different. Vermont, I'm proud of that about Vermont. But there too, if you have a few people sprinkled across this area who have the capacity to invest in some way, there, too, the CUD multiplies the effect. And the CUD, because it's a municipal entity, can borrow money at much lower cost than the private entity can. Now, I see Jeff Austin in the room. Uh, he, he works for Consolidated. We aren't there to compete with Consolidated. Remember, we came into being because Big Telecom Big phone company, big cable companies didn't want to touch rural areas. The density wasn't high enough to make the profit margins their shareholders would like to see. And groups of, community, of people in the community came together and said, what can we do? Let's organize to try to do something. The CUD is the, is the second evolutionary stage of how we get started, which I'll come back to in a few minutes. Uh, so, but these are some of the advantages of combining together. Uh, let's see, have I said, um, if I covered what I wanted in the net paragraph, I, I believe it, I have, yes. Operating a wide territory as a single district makes it possible, the service levels I just, remain, I just mentioned, you pay the same for that service level, no matter where you are in our territory. If our fiber cable goes past your door, and you want 700, 700, you'll pay the same for that as the person in downtown Norwich or downtown uh, Woodstock or Randolph, we're actually not in downtown Woodstock yet. Okay. Um, and, and I was also talking about um, aggregate, the outskirts of a town. Um, you know, um, I, the, donut, the term donut hole was used last week. And some ask, what's that mean? Well, uh, if you look at a town from the point of trying, view of trying to provide services economically, in the very center of town, you get a high population density. 
and for the bigger towns, you've already got a pretty competitive market there for service. You may have a phone company and a cable company competing with each other. There may be more than one of them. You get a little farther out, and you have a, a group of, of customers, potential customers, who maybe they're, they're pretty close together still, but they're not close enough together enough that corporate interests have been able have taken them on. And those that's a donut hole around a center high concentration. Uh, uh, rather, it's a donut around. The, the donut hole is the center. It's a donut surrounding that center where it can be highly economical to provide service. And again, in a regional approach, that higher density population helps to balance out the more the lower densities farther out. Okay. Uh, I included at this point some comments about CUDs, um, uh, advice perhaps to would-be CUDs. Uh, one, obviously, uh, if you want to, when you start building, you want to build where there's high demand. Uh, and that does not mean that you want to start building in the middle of your highly populated member towns, because there's competition there already. People are already served. They're not as hungry for broadband service as people who haven't got it yet and know how badly they need it. Uh, recently, in, over the past year, in, in months with good weather, we've been able, we've been connecting 100 new customers a month. And that's happening because we've been choosing where we build based on um, People can go to our website, they sign up for service, we look on where we look at where there's a high demand. We chose to build six towns to fill in six towns border to border uh, in the summer in the construction year 2018. We chose to build in uh, border to border another six towns in 2018. 17, did I, did I say 17? 17, 18. We have announced four towns that we'll fill in border to border in 2019 together with an additional 80 miles in selected neighborhoods of larger towns. The, the emphasis on how many people, what percentage of the whole town have signed up uh, actually disadvantages a big town whose center already has a lot of service. So we're also recognizing uh, neighborhoods that aren't served. And some of those are within a single town, some of them overlap borders of two. If you know um, the Upper Valley near the Connecticut River, there's a neighborhood that's called Jericho that's partly in Hartford and partly in Norwich and doesn't have uh, much service at all. Okay. Um, so all the members of a CUD do not have to be contiguous with each other, but it works a lot better when they are. Uh, originally, when we were first forming uh, 11 years ago, Montpelier joined. We haven't yet figured out how to deliver service to Montpelier. We are very glad that Central Vermont Internet has Montpelier as a member because we think it's going to make a lot more sense to the, for a for the CDI um, CUD to deliver service to Montpelier than than we could. And um, I already mentioned contracting with we contract with ValleyNet, but nothing about the CUD statute says that the implementing entity has to be uh, nonprofit. I could imagine. Uh, a CUD contracting with an independent telephone company. Or even, I don't know, even with the big telephone company. Uh, because uh, provided, you know, there are enough protections for both parties there, the CUD being municipal may be able to borrow money at a lower cost than the, comer than the small phone company could. And so they both benefit. The phone company gets the capital to with which to upgrade the network, and the residents of the district get the service. Okay. Now, uh, I will pause for questions about structure before I proceed to talk about specific challenges. Okay. Now, I want to talk about Make Ready, which you heard about this morning from my friend and colleague, Jim Maslin who is a member of our executive committee. Um, and I, I hope that I won't bore you by being repetitious here. Uh, 
You already know that um, there is, under PUC rules, under federal as well as state law, a, a series of, of utility poles along the public right of way is a public good. And so a bona fide uh, communications entity can apply to put their cables on the poles and pay rent. Uh, the rent rates are regulated by the PUC, the rental rate, pole space rental rate. Uh, but before the new entity can go on the pole, typically cables may need to be moved, existing cables may have to be moved to make room for the newcomer. It is also possible, if the pole isn't tall enough, that moving the cables around to make room for the newcomer would mean that the clearance underneath the lowest cable would now be inadequate to the ground. So the newcomer may have to pay for a whole new pole to be replacing the pole. It's called a pole set. Unless the pole was already not tall enough and already the cables were hanging too low, in which case the newcomer doesn't have to pay that for that one. Either way, the pole has to be replaced. Uh, with apologies to my sometime friend, Stoff, in Vermont, at least in our part of Vermont, most of the poles are jointly owned by the power company and the phone company. <laughs> this intrinsically creates accountability issues. Uh, now, the two entities owning, jointly owning these poles have agreements, town, to, town by town, for this town, if a new pole has to be set, this guy's supposed to set the new pole. If in, the, uh, in this other town, the other guy is supposed to set all the new poles when new poles are required. That's, you need to know that first. So what's the process? We lay out our plan, our route. We identify up to 200 poles that perform a logical sequence along one or more roads. We send in an application with a per pole fee. This is according to PUC procedure, defined procedures. And the, company has, the companies have 60 days to get back to us with a quote for the cost of preparing that set of poles. And this involves a survey. A survey, or write-out, as it's called, is engineer from each company and one of our engineers, too. They get in a pickup truck together and they go out and stop at each pole. I oh, got to move that. That one's okay. And they take notes. And that data goes back to headquarters, and in due course, we get the quote. Now, we need to pay the quote in advance for the work to be done. Now, typically, uh, not all the poles need any work done. And most of the time, the work that needs to be done is some cables need moving. That's all. But sometimes a new pole will be needed. For our 2017 build, there were about 6,400 poles in all involved in building about 250 miles. 23% of those poles needed some, something done. According to PUC rules, when we have paid, the work is supposed to get done within 120 days. 14% of those polls actually got done by all the parties involved 360 or more days after we paid, not 120. I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, with the massive amount of building that EC Fiber was doing in a certain amount of time, um, is there typically constraint in the system to well, d deal with a certain um, pacing of... The PUC rules uh, allow more time if the number of poles involved is exceeds a certain percentage of all the poles in the state that that entity owns. Uh, the total number of poles that needed work was well under the, the maximum that would get more than 120 days allowed. Okay. It looked from our side as if neither company was responsibly planning and scheduling the work. 
we realize that they have limited crews. Now, I want to jump ahead. I'll, I've got something that, that is critical, but I want to acknowledge right now that in the summer of 2018, we got much better cooperation from the telephone company than we did from the power company, or, or rather, late, late work was typically the power company, not the phone company. So things changed around in 2018 relative to 2017. But we had a series of unfortunate events in 17. We already had applications that were well past what we paid when we got to September and finally filed an a, a, a complaint with the PUC. There are no enforcement procedures except to complain to the PUC, whereupon, to their credit, the phone company folks immediately said, this is awful, we didn't want to be in this situation, we will do everything we can to get all of our work done by the end of October. Now, they already had done a lot of their work. They moved their cables. They just hadn't set the new poles that the power company needed to do their part of the job. So at the end of October, they said, all right, we've got them all done. But unfortunately, when the GMP crews got out there, and the GMP crews didn't go out right away because they'd stopped waiting for the work to be done, I think. But they went out there in December, and six of the poles that had supposedly been replaced hadn't been. And I don't know who. I mean, I'm sure Jeff told us the truth, but somebody told you things that weren't true. So. Everybody involved has agreed that was terrible, and I really want to credit Consolidated has been a much more cooperative and helpful partner, but it's a mess, and it's partly a mess because dual po joint pole ownership creates diffuse accountability. Uh, when we discovered this problem, you know, we, I, I'll tell you the truth. We realize when we pay 120 for a work to be done within 120 days, and it goes beyond that, we're making an interest-free loan to the pole owners until the work is done. We're not going to be able to string our cable and realize any income from customer service, customer revenue, until we can get on the pole. So, you know, one way to approach this would be couldn't we get one and a half percent a month interest on what we've paid until the job is done? But the Department of Public Service has a much cleaner solution, which is outlined in the telecom plan and which they've already moved by petition to the PUC to try to implement. And that is, if the work is late, the applicant should have the right to engage a third party contractor to do the work which would get paid for out of the payment that's already been made to the utility companies for the work. And this would be a major breakthrough from our point of view. We hope this will happen. Uh, the bill that as drafted, H-53 as, sorry, H-93 as drafted, makes reference to the main utility commission's rules. At the time it was being drafted, we didn't know how rapidly the, our own department would move to file a petition with the Vermont PUC. But over in Maine, they instituted that kind of rule about a year and a half or two years ago, and since they did, it hasn't been necessary to resort to it once. And that's despite the fact that at the time, not only did they put that rule in, they cut back the amount of time allowed from 120 days to 60 plus a couple of 15-day extensions. So I've got a question on this payment that's been made. Would that be held, or is it now held in like an escrow account? Or I have no idea. Okay. They don't, I, I don't. Who do you we, write the check to? We write the check to the company. We write mm -hmm. a check to Green Mountain Power, we write another check to Consolidated. Right now, um, they may tell, you know, if the dispute required arises about whether they're late, then they may tell us when they think they got it. It would be good to see a provision. This isn't mentioned yet in anybody's draft rule, or, but, but it would be good to see a provision that says it, if the company acknowledges receipt, that establishes the date. In the absence of documentation, 
then the payment is assumed to have been received either five days after it was mailed or when it cleared the bank, whichever it was sooner. But, you know, similarly, they get to do, the, the, the clock doesn't start ticking until they've gotten any necessary permits from the Agency of Transportation to cross to uh, cross the highway or something like that. Well, wouldn't it be good to encourage them to document when they filed that for that permit and when they got that permit? Then everybody's on the same page. Everybody can see there's a need for transparency and accountability. And the system doesn't have either right now. And not, I mean, some of this will be controversial, I'm sure, and some of it should be pretty straightforward. I guess the other question I've got is do you think there's enough third party, third party uh, construction folks out there to, to do the work? Well, that is a good question. Uh, right now, the companies are required to maintain lists of third party contractors who they consider competent to do the work. Uh, we, we get a lot of our work done by a, a, a company based in Northfield called Eustis Cable, E-U-S-T-I-S. E uh, and except when, except when there's major storm damage and Eustis is all over northern New England trying to help repair it, Eustis seems to have crews. Uh, in the present labor market, uh, qualified line people are some wood scares. Uh, we know that over the past few years, uh, the phone companies uh, laid off a lot of field staff. So they are somewhat staff limited. Uh, but if they're going to accept the money for the make ready work, oughtn't they to be providing enough staff to carry it out? Um, so that's that's my take on the topic of make ready. I hope I haven't been too tedious about it. Yet. Well, so uh, the book, did you do you feel, um, Herb, that you've covered your? Um, I'm looking at the fourth page of your testimony, which I think focuses mostly on finance. funding. Yes, and I just want to um, just being. Uh, uh, attentive to the clock and your time and oh, our, our next guest. No, yes. this has been terrific. Um, I want to be clear if, if you have more testimony to give or if you feel you've covered most of the. I testimony. want to talk about funding. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if if I, I could go right into that now well, or you we might want to take Jeremy and then let me come back and talk about funding. I don't know. Why don't we give you a few minutes to finish up on funding? All right. If All right. we've got a couple of questions mm -hmm. or is this relevant for, to this? For, it's yeah. relevant to the yeah, ready. Yeah, sure, and, sure. and so I just wonder what your take on Christine's idea about, about having the electric utilities run the fiber in the in that 40 inch space. If the fibers run in the 40 inch space, in the uh, power space as opposed to the communication space, then the crews that do that work will be much more highly paid crews. So I'm skeptical about the net savings. Because it's not just running the cable, it's making the splices in that space for all the feeders, the fiber cable mm -hmm. feeders, mm -hmm. from the main cable out to each premise. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. costs are going to mount up that way. And I am skeptical. Okay. Uh, I've been told that some of the electric co-ops that are deploying fiber cable in their territories are actually uh, doing it in the communication mm -hmm. space. Despite the apparent advantage of going up in the power space, mm -hmm. they're actually doing it in the communication space. They found <coughs> it is simpler and more straightforward to do down there. So, so they I'm, move all the, all the other wires down so, yeah. they can, so the phone can right. be the bottom. Yeah. All right. And um, um, there was one other point about, oh darn, I, I made a note to myself about that. Oh, the money available from the agriculture department. Are we moving into financing now? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a sidebar <laughs> to the financing. I just, why don't we take another five minutes yeah. and then we're going to invite all right. Jeremy. Okay. Um, the, the money available for, from the uh, Agriculture Department, not much of it's available in Vermont because it comes through the Rural Utility Service and the Rural Utility Service will not make any grants for territory supposedly served by some other grant that they've already made. Enough said? Yes. All right. For me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Funding. Perfect. 
<laughs> As a municipal body, uh, once the CUD has positive cash flow and a track record of steady growth, it can go into it can do revenue bonds in the municipal bond market. Of course, the question is how do you get to that stage? Now, how we got there wouldn't be practical for anybody else to do, and we wouldn't recommend it. We had the good fortune three years after the credit meltdown of 2008. We had the good fortune that three people wanted to fund a demonstration project. Well, by definition, that happens once. So we had we started with expensively borrowed money, uh, no payments required for the first five years. Interest was getting capitalized at 11 half percent, but that got us off the ground. We built a 20, 25. This is before CUDs were defined. Remember. We built a 20, 25-mile loop. We started serving people along the, that roadway, and the people on the side road said, what about us? So we started offering promissory note funding in multiples of $2,500. And over the next few years, we got more than 450 distinct investors. We raised, including that first three-quarter million, we raised a total of $7 million. Then when the CUD statute passed, we refinanced out those loans. But our total debt load right now probably includes about two million dollars from the high from from refinancing prepayment penalties and so on that original money. So now we look at this proposal from the administration, and we think it's a very excellent idea. Because at the, it's true at the outset you can't you have nothing to collateralize. At the outset you haven't got credibility with the bank. These are not bankable loans. But the, and they're not, they're, they're riskier than conventional loans. They're not extremely high risk, but there's a possibility of failure. Now, you know, in, in state, states are often more willing to make, and federal government too, more willing to make grants than loans. If you're going to make loans, a few of them aren't going to work, and most of them are. If the money comes back, and you can use it again. Aren't you better off than with the grant that went down the drain? And yet, the body politic as a whole is all, ready to get, is all too ready to be excited by cheap shots from a reporter who says, look, this loan went bad. These government officials did a terrible thing. We've all got to think about that. But I'm not saying that the loan fund that the administration is proposing is high risk. No. I'm saying it's an excellent idea. I think funding 90% from a Vita loan and asking the communities involved to come to put 10% of skin in the game is a very good balance. But I say that that 10% ought to come from private sources, mm -hmm. local private sources, not from public, not from taxation. And that's the last thing that I want to talk to talk about. Um, I pers Now, this is a strong personal opinion. Uh, actually, the first half of this, well, my whole executive committee agrees with me about it. Uh, the second one, they may, but it's my opinion. All right, the first point is that um, <coughs> capacity to pay with property tax varies a lot, but it's typically low in rural communities. If there's any possibility that Joining in a CUD is going to mean a hit on your property tax. Remember, this is municipal property tax. It isn't even income sensitivity adjusted for most people. Then it's going to be much harder to pass the vote to join that CUD. I think that's a significant drawback. Um, but the second objection that I, oh, and, and I've also said, I live in a very rich town. By some accounts, Norwich is the richest town in the state. I am proud of the fact that the restriction against using local tax kept my town from building broadband years before anybody else. I'm proud of the fact that the restrictions forced towns like mine to band together and serve a whole region rather than just themselves. Now, the second concern is a taxpayer equity issue. This is my personal opinion. Uh, no, I take a back seat to nobody on the importance of broadband. I loved it. I practically cheered when commission attorneys said, 
Broadband is the connective tissue of the body politic. Yes, that's true. But I look at the old farmer with a lot of land who doesn't expect to use broadband at all. And I just think it's wrong that that poor guy is going to end up paying more in his tax bill than the young professional in the, with less land who is really going to use it. I want to be sure that the way we fund... Second story condo in the Right. I want to be sure that the way we fund this public, this public service is paid for the people who are but paid for the by the people who are using it, not by the people who aren't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, one question. Have you seen any appreciable increase in property values in EC fiber territory yes. since Yes. Yes. And conversely, we have seen that in areas that don't have it, property values are uh, have dropped 10, 15 percent. And so when property values go up, property values taxes go. Um, mm, not necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. It may be the pro not necessarily. The tax rate goes down. It's more of a it's it it's more of an effect that it takes a lot longer to sell a property that doesn't have broadband. Yeah, I'll be more pointed when um, in towns that you have. Um, been successful in deploying fiber. I'm presuming that the value of the farmer's property, mm. who you go buy, but doesn't use the fiber, also benefits from. That's the probably true, and that's enough of a hit to impose on that guy already, isn't it? Well, the question <laughs> is. Well, I think we've just questioned whether or not his pro property taxes go up. His his. Property rate may go down. It may. Yeah. Yeah. But there. value only goes up when he sells it. Yep. I mean, it only matters if you sell it. Just like yeah. you if only you lose sell. money in the stock yeah. market when you sell. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it makes it more valuable in, in that, I understand, in that, it, makes, in that yeah. it makes it more sellable. Yeah. Right. But it's only more it, the money right only right. is so realized to, if it's sold. Let's not litigate this. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be an interesting discussion. <laughs> it certainly is. It certainly so, is. Thank you. Earl. But I, I think we have, pro my last summary statement, yeah. I think we have proven by our success yeah. that this can be done in rural Vermont. Yeah. And it, it can be, and we, did, we got started in the teeth of the Great Recession. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy, if, if you want to join, I'm going to stand up and stretch while sure. you <laughs> sit down. Good to see you, Mike Weiser. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, I'm uh, Jeremy Hansen. I'm from Berlin. Um, I'm also on the, the Berlin Select Board. I'm a computer science professor at Norwich University in Northfield. I teach networking and security and a lot of other stuff. So I'm actually coming at this problem from um, you know, two different angles as a municipal official who's heard a lot of people complaining and who has had this conversation about property taxes and I can't sell my house and I can't do my work from home. Um, but also from a you know, the point of view of a, of a geek who, is, who knows how to build these things and who has been professionally responsible for um, managing these things in the past. So um, Last year, a bunch of towns in central Vermont uh, helped create something called Central Vermont Internet and other communications union district, uh, inspired by the success of EC Fiber. Um, and we recently started doing business as CV Fiber, uh, sort of a, a rebranding. Um, we're currently at 16 towns, uh, including um, um, Representative Pat's territory um, here in Montpelier and uh, actually Representative Jessup's territory as well. Um, we're going to 17 with uh, hopefully with with Woodbury joining us uh, next week. It's also my territory. It is also your territory. That's why I mentioned it. Um, and so, so we have a lot of excitement. We have a lot of uh, folks in central Vermont. So Washington County, Lamoille County, and Orange County. Um, a lot of different kinds of towns. You know, we have Berry City, Berry Town, Montpelier, which are rather different than Roxbury and Elmore and Woodbury. Um, but it's part of our mission to serve all of them as a, as a public service. Um, we are, again, following the EC Fibers model, and this idea of um, five or six per mile is something that, you know, we have a, we have a, a guy on our board who represents um, Callis, and he's a GIS expert, and he could show us 
you know, the segments of roads and how many people, you know, on that segment of road and the density, and it's, it's totally doable, and it looks to be doable in almost any town in Vermont, frankly. Um, so we're at a much earlier state than EC Fiber. Um, I have to say that IRV in particular and EC Fiber in general has been extremely, extremely critical to us getting as far as fast as we have. Um, it's in our plans and our budget to build out our first pilot of roughly five or six miles by the end of this year and have people turned on by the end of this year. Whether that's too um, aggressive or not uh, remains to be seen, but we are moving forward as if that's the case. I have a question for you there, Jeremy. Sure. And, and, and I don't want to um, knock you off course, but um, in terms of uh, EC Fiber being critical um, to, you, you know, to, to where you've gotten to at this point, um, is it looking at the template that they have created and, and how they moved in their history? Is it um, kind of direct help that you've gotten for them in um, some of the granular issues you've got to work through as you're building this business? But both of those. Yeah. Both of those. I mean, when I, when I learned about what they were doing, I just tried to, you know, digest as much as possible about what was publicly available. And then I reached out to, to Irv and I reached out to, to their CEO, Carol Monroe. Um, they came to the first meeting of, you know, I, I brought a bunch of folks together in Barry City, um, municipal officials, other interested folks, and said, this is, this is my vision. I want to make, essentially want to make an EC fiber here in central Vermont. Yeah. And uh, e everybody was really excited. Yeah. And uh, the reason I ask is I'm interested in the replicability of this. And I'm, understanding that, that different regions, different towns are different. Um, of course they are. Um, but at the same time, um, PC Fiber can do it if you find things in, in their um, business plan and model that um, maybe some work, maybe some don't. Mm -hmm. But you know, where are the seven other places in Vermont that this is replicable? Is what I'm really interested in. Sure. Yeah. So. And, and actually, next on my next on my list of things to mention to, um, I'm I'm not going to directly counterpoint some of Christine Hawkwist's points, but um, the, the, there are some things that I that I want to comment on. So Kingdom Fiber, you know, was is looking at basically using this a similar model, really starting in Craftsbury, um, roughly the same target for the number of people per mile, and they've already turned on people, Craftsbury, like in the last few months. Uh, that's a private entity, and K the guy that runs Kingdom Fiber is actually the representative for, for Plainfield on our board. So he's actively helping us and is also, you know, showing us what are his finances look like, how is he doing, you know, what's his business model. And he's you know, sharing with us his insight about specific hiccups, including pull attachment, which I'll get to in a second, um, that he's run into. Um, and that's, I think, having, um, you know, having Irvin EC Fiber um, as a resource on one side and Michael Birnbaum and Kingdom Fiber on the other as two completely different ways of going about this is really, um, is both inspiring and really helpful so when we come and we, we come to our monthly board meetings when we have you know 16 people sitting at the table and talking about this, um, we can reasonably quickly get the answers that we need to to go forward. So I think the CUD model is a is a winning model, and um, and I, I don't mean to sound you know, you know aggressive or cocky or anything like that, but you know if the legislature decides to do nothing, I'm I'm still going to go forward with this. We will build Central Vermont. Um, it's just that. We, we will build it much slower and more on an EC fiber timeline where we will have to look more at promissory notes and other sources of funding um, that we could do this much more efficiently. We could do this much more smoothly, much more cheaply for the public good. I mean, we are a public entity looking to do public service. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to step out in a few minutes. And I've been. I know your time is uh, really valuable. I appreciate you being here. And I'm sorry I'm going to miss most of your testimony. But talk. Based on what you've just been talking about, I, and the replicability that the chair is referencing, could you see, um, in order to help other places in Vermont, um, what does, what about um, some sort of a technical um, commission, or um, you know, a place for um, a more formal place for prospective CUDs to come together? Could you talk about like? Have you ever thought of like, boy, it would be great if there were some sort of technical working group? I don't know. I would, yeah, I would, I would love to see that, and I've, I've already, and I'm, I'm sure Irv has done the same. I've already advised people who are like right now looking at forming CUDs. There's one down, probably cl closer to you, um, a bit to the north though. Um, we're looking at doing the same thing with surrounding territories, and they, I essentially just throw them, yeah, my big kind of bucket of documents that I collected 
as I was, you know, as I was developing and kind of spearheading this and putting this in front of select boards and city councils and saying, here's how it's going to work. I mean, I'm not going to promise that I have a business plan done, but that's something that we're, we're budgeted for building this year. Um, but no, I could definitely see, you know, getting stakeholders together and saying, here, here's how we did it. Here's kind of the general tra trajectory. And I know I've, I've seen some materials from you that sort of has a nice graph of like, here are the responsibilities that you sort of need to, to solve, that these are the things that you need to solve before you actually go and build and can turn people on. And I think that would be that's really valuable. I think that would be really valuable. And something uh, Christine Hulk said that I, I really did like is the notion of a, um, a broadband manager. And uh, uh, I don't know that ACCD is the right place for it. Probably DPS um, uh, with Clay Purvis or funding them so that they can be um, more involved in the process. And they've been super helpful too, both ACCD and DPS, in getting us moving forward um, with this in, in, in different ways. So I don't know if that answers your question. That's helpful. Can we continue though when we, when we can get another five minutes of time? Of course. I would just say I like to tell people, we're glad to tell you about the mistakes we made so that you'll have to find your own. <laughs> I, 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 totally re I totally remember that. Um, so um, I said we're going to look at building a small pilot this year. Uh, this is, so right now we're actually collecting um, con contributions, charitable contributions, so you know, I won't give you the shakedown pitch right now. <laughs> 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 it is tax deductible. You're asking the wrong room. <laughs> just, just say it. We have, we have pay taxes. But, this, but it's, it's, it's on Orca, so somebody's watching me. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, anyways um, we are also in the process of developing a partnership with WEC, and there was a, a comment before about a Washington Electric Co-op going out and seeking grant money essentially to work with us in partnership to build a feasibility study business plan to look at does it make sense for them to get involved. Um, we also have, I'm, I'm waiting to hear the results of whether we got an ACCD grant to do the same. So we're looking at um, doing surveying, business plan development, a feasibility study soon. But we're going to be, I mean, we're going to be working together with WEC to try to do that and as much as possible um, work, work with them and sort of push our mission and their mission simultaneously because I think there's a fair bit of excitement over on over on their part um, without any um, legislative stick required um, and so and WEC is aware of their need for fiber both for uh, smart grid and some of the other these other applications that are out there um, there's a one big benefit to working with WEC. They own all their own poles. They're not in that situation where you have dual pole ownership. And if they're on board with making this happen, it's that, that pole make ready process is super fast. Super fast com comparatively, I would say. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's exciting. And um, so part of my job, I mean, as in my day job, I mean, part of my job is to look at the future. So I do spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, what Vermont looks like five, 10, 20 years um, down the road. And I think, um, WEC is coming to that same realization that um, it's not necessarily going to be business as usual for a number of reasons, whether that's you know, how, they're, how they're dealing with renewables or how they're dealing with um, um, balancing power requirements or being able to you know, turn off smart appliances at certain times to, to smooth out loads or you know, deal with electric cars or batteries or these sorts of things. And uh, you know, do you need a gigantic, huge pipe to do it? Nope. Um, but future applications could, and this could make a lot of things easier, I, I, I think. Um, one of the things that we're running up against is in order for us to really qualify for municipal loans, we have to have a certain number of years of audited financials, so actual revenues and actual expenditures. So we're looking at at least three years before we can even go after those revenue bonds. Um, so what do we do for those first three years? Hope and pray? Um, we're going to have to look at promissory notes or some other mechanism. Um, so this, this bridge funding, getting us through those first three years, the first five years or whatever, is really, really important. And one of the things that I would like all of you to think about um, making that available. Um, we have very motivated communities, um, but not all of our communities have the money to, to, you know, for us to find donors that are going to write us checks, you know, and, you know, that add up to millions of dollars. We're going to build something, but we're going to build something that's you know in the first year that's going to cost less than less than a half a million dollars. Um, but we're, we're going to build something. If, if that's how we have to start, then then that's fine. Um,
can kind of pick around at the nibble around at the edges. Uh, we're not sold on, sold on building in the electric space. There's some tech, technical feasibility issues that Irv addressed that we're also rather concerned about. The cost of um, putting the 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 line the linemen that are working at the electric utility those much more expensive technicians to do that. And so a scenario that we envision is so imagine I mean this never happens in Vermont. Imagine there's an ice storm. <laughs> and it takes down some lines. What are the linemen going to prioritize if the, the utility is managing all of those lines? So when there's an outage, they're going to turn people's power on first. Are then they then going to go back later a few days afterwards and then reconnect the fiber optic cables? I mean, is there going to be a delay? And that, that could be that could be really terrible. Rather than we could have, you know, line workers working for the utility restoring power service and then folks working for the internet service provider going and repairing the, the fiber optic cables. It doesn't have to be an either or um, sort of thing. It just makes the complexity of their responding to, excuse me, their responding to emergencies uh, more challenging and more expensive and take longer because um, there's more stuff that they have to worry about. Um, so that and that kind of fiber that lives up in the in the electric space is uh, not really the kind of fiber that makes fiber to the premises, fiber to the home, um, <coughs> easy to do. Um, so I think you know, looking at the telecom plan that came out of DPS, I think uh, addresses a lot of sort of where we are um, in in Vermont and gives some good policy suggestions. And I want to uh, talk about um, talk about some of those too, and also address some of uh, Christine and Herb's comments. Um, Redeclaring broadband, I mean like real broadband, as 100 megabits per second, I think would be a great step forward because that's completely achievable with with more than just fiber technology, but fiber makes it makes it easiest. Um, one of the question, yeah. So I'm I'm new. So when you're saying that, are you talking this 100 up and 100 down too, or just one way? Statute says 100 up and 100 down is where we're going to be by 2021. So if that's something that we're at, no, I know, I know. But I mean, if that's something that we're really, if we're really gonna take that seriously, then yeah, it's gonna be symmetric. It's gonna be 100 up and down. Okay. That's not something, so the symmetric is not something that anything really other than fiber can do. Okay. So cable can get close-ish with some really, some of the really new cutting edge cable technology. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, looking at, um, so we are, we're a municipality. So I'm on, a, on the select board, I'm, you know, re required to required to release meeting minutes. We're required to to warn meetings and that sort of thing. And as a communications union district, we have to do the same. We're also we also have to abide by if somebody makes a public records request, we are obliged to provide those things. And it's not terribly clear um, when we have some of the things that would be um, to our competitive advantage. So we're in this interesting thing. We are a competitive entity that's also a public entity. It's kind of, it's, we don't have really anything else like that in, in Vermont. So it's conceivable that we could be asked to provide as a public records request something that could be damaging to our ability to compete. So I think looking at um, potential solutions to that, you know, some way that we could per perhaps say, we are declaring this as our, as our governing board, we're gonna say that this is competitively sensitive and is not subject to disclosure. Or maybe there's some other way of, of, of carving that out so that we're not compelled to provide those things. Um, and I want to say that as, as somebody who does a lot of research in, in privacy and you know openness in government in my like research and the things that I do, I, I, I don't say this lightly. This is not something where like, yeah, we'll just add another exemption exemption to the 150 or so that are out there. I mean, Jim Condos would, would beat me up. Um, I, that's not, I, I'm, uh, this, is a, th this is probably going to be a requirement because if, it's, if it doesn't come out, it's going to be settled by the courts and I'm not sure that, you know, we got five thousand dollars in the bank right now. <laughs> um, probably don't have to do the math to figure out how that would how that would work out. If it went to court, that is um, getting access to to good data about where the polls actually are. Um, I think that's important. That's a, a conversation that uh, someone else on um, on my board, a representative from Callis, who is uh, he's down in Senate Finance. He was talking about that just as I as I came up. Um, 
I think there's some, some good things that we could do to make sure that we know, you know, where the utility poles are, that there is some good, there's some good data out there in you know, the Vermont Center for Geographical Information System, that we can put that together and that way people, when we, people like me, when we're going out and doing these feasibility studies, that we actually have reasonable data and that we actually reasonably understand where the poles and where the lines are. I don't really care that much about where exactly all of the network components are. That's not really useful. But knowing where the cable, where the cables are, where the poles are, that can help us more quickly decide where the best place for us to start, where the best place for us to extend our network into, where that's going to be. Um, Christine also said something about um, prohibiting overbuilding where there's already fiber. Um, I am very skeptical that you can compel any private entity to force them to to open access to their um, to their fiber. So. Um, I'm expecting, uh, I'm expecting that um, we will be overbuilding with fiber, and um, I would, I would respectfully request that you not touch that, because there are places where we have to build fiber, um, because that's the only way that we're going to get from, you know, that's we're going to get out all the way out into, you know, up by Lake Elmore where we have to, you know, swing back over through Morristown to get up there. There's already fiber in Morristown. We're going to have to overbuild it in order to get into Elmore, for example. Um, and I want to mention that uh, we actually abut Stowe. So if Stowe... No, if, they, if, 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 the, if the Stowe Select Board decides that they want to apply to join the district, that is certainly within um, the realm of possibility. It might not be a terrible idea, just say. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Yeah. Um, We've got a couple of good assets in Stowe, so... Okay. Um, all right. Um, as I understand it, there's some new federal funding coming online through USDA. I literally got a call from them on the way over here, so I'm exciting to, excited to hear what's, what that's going to look like. Um, I'm not, I, I don't know anything about it. Um, so what's blocking co-ops from doing this today? Um, I don't know that there's really anything blocking co-ops in, in Vermont from doing this today. Um, co-ops are, um, as Christine said, co-ops are rather conservative and that totally makes sense, but I think the writing's on the wall, and I think the co-ops are starting to understand that getting involved in this process is um, getting a seat at the table is an important step to making, um, you know, again, to, to hitting their mission, and whether that's WAC or whether that's Velco or Vermont Electric or whatever. Um, I think all of the all of the co-op utilities are recognizing this. Um, and I'm just going to wrap this up saying um, the administration's proposal, I think, is an okay start. Um, but unless there's actually a reasonably large, reasonably accessible to communications union district revolving loan fund, um, unless that's made available, this doesn't actually help CV fiber very much at all. I mean, it, it's good that we have a feasibility study, um, but we're getting funding to do that through other other mechanisms. But if there's not a, if there's not a pool of money that we can borrow from until we can go three years down the road, go get those municipal bonds and just pay that stuff back. That way, and then you can give the money to the next folks that are interested in using it. Um, this process is going to be much slower. We're not going to be um, larger scale until, you know, probably three or four years later than we would. Um, I have a question just on the, on the financing, and this might be uh, two in the weeds, but um, certainly the concept of a revolving loan fund is it's pretty tangible. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there an avenue uh, that you can see by which, um, whether through similar um, state funding, there is a mechanism to credit enhancement um, for borrowing that a CUD would do by which um, state funds could be more broadly leveraged? Um, where, uh, you know, as, as Urban testified, and I agree, you know, some of these loans will work, some won't. But um, if there is a um, buy-down of the credit risk um, by the state in supporting a loan that you get from a private entity, um, that spreads the, the, you know, the, the lendability, if you will, much broader with a smaller amount of money. And I, I don't know if that's something that sure. you've even gone far enough down the path to look at, but that's something I'm kind of interested. Yeah, sort of, sort of like it's, uh, underwriting our loans. I mean, if I, I'm not 100% sure whether there's anybody out there right now that would um, that would look at us where it's just you know a bunch of folks around a table saying, "Hey, we have a good idea." I mean, that's kind of Silicon Valley stuff right there. But um, 
we're you're just going to say, yeah, we'll, we'll write you a loan. Um, you know, would it, would the backing of the state of Vermont help? Almost certainly, but still, this is a. Um, I, I guess the answer is I, I I don't really know. I don't really know if even with that backing, if somebody coming from we're, we're basically we're at five thousand dollars, like I said, five thousand dollars and no infrastructure, is anybody commercially going to touch us and say? I want, I want you to lend us $10 million so that we can build out you know, uh, half a dozen towns if anybody's gonna, gonna take us seriously or if they're just gonna, just gonna chuckle and walk away. So. Herb, did you have a something? I, isn't that the purpose of the administration's proposal? I think some of it is. The loan loss reserve. Some of it is. To, to back loans of up to two million by Vita. Yeah. And, and two million is enough to get up to a, a significant, a, an adequate base to attract municipal funds. Those will be five-year loans, as I recall. Uh, Jeremy, good to see you. Okay. Um, I think if it were a Silicon Valley group, you'd have people throwing money at you. But, um, my question is, is uh, about scale and replicability. And is there a size, minimum size, that this needs to be? You know, you're talking 17 towns, EC fibers grown to. We have, if you count Montpelier, we have 24 members. 24 members. Um, you know, can, can five towns do this sustainably? Depends on what they are. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it really, it, it, I mean that's, that's the big answer to all these questions, right? It, it really depends. It also depends on the operational model that they choose. You know, if they hire, let's say they, you know, they, they hired ValleyNet. Like you know, like EC Fiber does, uh, if they hired ValleyNet to, to manage that, and they had um, the ability to find somebody who was just who was willing to essentially run stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could probably sit down and figure out the fin the financial model and the business model to make that work. Is it going to come out to the same to the same cost as EC Fiber? Probably not. Um, is it? It's prob It's going to be more expensive the smaller it is. I don't know what that sweet spot is. I would say five. I think you could probably do five if I'm just making making stuff up here, kind of, because I understand the, the yeah. financing. Uh, maybe more than five, it, it, as I, depending on which towns they are. But mm -hmm. ten is a better bet. Uh, presuming I, it's number of homes passed and your <clears throat> yeah. uptake rate. Right. In terms right. Of, we're talking Colchester, Essex, Milton, Lewis. Okay. You know. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a rather different <laughs> business model than me building in Roxbury and Granville. Right. Yeah, I would say that well, Granville's one of our members. Yeah, no, I am. Yeah. But I what would. twenty-four? I would say that our two dozen is getting near the upper limit of practical size because mm -hmm. you've uh, you've got governance issues with a governing board that big, and a territory that you've got to cover. It may be, make more sense to have another similar district than one huge district. That's why I used to say we don't have imperial ambitions. So, so um, on, your, on the kind of operating um, side, you have a uh, a, uh, a valley net type entity in mind. Is that something you will hold in house? Is, is um, we're working on that. I mean, that's that's part of our developing the, the business plan and the feasibility study. It, okay. it depends on where we build. There's we have um, a handful of potential partners. I mean, um, WEC being a partner in some aspects of it, but you also don't necessarily have to have. Um, ValleyNet does basically everything. It wouldn't necessarily have to be that way. I mean, we could also, you know, hire our own employees. We could, you know, we could, you know, lease space and have office and be, have, you know, CV fiber employees. Um, but yeah, there's there's other options. There's folks with the technical capacity in the area that we've already been talking to about. You know, can we get you to do this? Um, you know, we could so we could contract out with folks from out of state to do like help desk. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of different angles, and, and what we're going to do when, when we do our feasibility study and business plan development is figure that out. Is essentially, here, you know, here are the here are the three approaches that we can go to running the show, and here's uh, here's how that the the money is going to work with that, and we will be deciding that I would say within the next um, three or four months. Okay. Uh, I wanted to. I, I almost mentioned this in my testimony. Our bond underwriters told us that they really liked the fact that we didn't have any employees of our own because that means we don't have any questions of unfunded pension liabilities 
and potential investors in municipal bonds really look at that. So that's a good reason to try to find a one or more partners to work with to do the implementation work for you.